Yes, we're on. Yes. Good evening, all. Al Diorio. Like to uh, call this evening's meeting to order. I'm showing uh, 710. Excuse the delay. So our first and only agenda item this evening <clears throat> is a continuation of the July 1st planning board meeting. It's a development plan review, a photovoltaic solar energy system, Revit Energy LLC AP7 lots 62, 62A and 63, 15 Frontier Road Revit Energy LLC applicant. Now, before we get down to the uh, the meat of this evening's meeting, I just want to take the opportunity to exercise a little uh, authority here. It's, uh, it's a little past seven o'clock. This is our only agenda item this evening. Uh, this is a special meeting that we uh, put together uh, at the request of the applicant. No problem doing that, of course. But uh, I want to caution that if we have to get to 10.0, that will be the end of this evening's meeting. So I issue this warning only to caution and respectfully request that everyone in the audience, the applicant, the applicant's witnesses, planning board, the members of the public who may be listening, please, if you would, consider the time and keep your comments and testimony as brief and concise as possible. I certainly would appreciate your cooperation. So just in terms of uh, perhaps a little bit of structure to this evening's meeting, I have the following thoughts and I'd be looking for the planning board members to concur that this is a good idea. A little bit of structure would be a review of the current plan. This would be by the applicant or the applicant's representative. In this review, by the way, I'd like to categorize this as an executive summary. I'm not looking for an hour's worth of testimony. I just need a brief overview of the current status of the most revised version of the plan. Then I would be suggesting that we should hear from Crossman concerning the status of the current revision to the plan. And then I would like to open it up to the planning board members as to their comments uh, about some general categories. We'll get to this uh, in a little bit more detail uh, at that time. But planning board members, does that sound like a reasonable approach to this evening's meeting? Ron here, I agree with that. Have I been unmuted? Yes, Ron. Thank you, Ron. Okay, thank you. We have everyone here, they're just not responding. This, this is Emily, I agree. Thank you, Ralph, for putting everything together so organized. Okay, so we, and I appreciate that. Are we on board with this kind of structure? Uh, yes, yes. Chair, this is uh, Attorney Karen Browning on behalf of the applicant. Um, we certainly agree. Um, however, I just want to make a, one small point. We do have um, uh, Tom Sweeney with us um, to testify as to uh, real estate valuations specifically as to the, the, the abutting properties. And also um, your uh, planner had requested previously that we provide additional testimony on the topic of uh, environmental. And we do have someone from SAGE to testify with that respect. I do believe that both of those um, experts would be very brief in their testimony. Um, and we simply request that we be able to just present that at some point tonight. So thank you very much for that comment. Let me, let me make this inquiry. For those two experts, have they already presented reports? Or, yes, testimony no. So what, what we don't need is someone reading their report to us. We have the reports, you've done a wonderful job by the way. Lots of good information. So again, I, I don't think what we need is anybody reading their report to us and calling it testimony. If there's something unusual, something uh, that's not captured in their report, uh, perhaps that qualifies as additional testimony, but are you getting my point? I am, and I think that maybe we could agree um, that 
uh, both of these individuals will summarize their conclusions um, and maybe take one or two questions from me if needed, and that would be it. Okay, I think I can agree to that. Okay, so let's not, uh, let's not waste more time. Let's move on. And again, the first item here under the, uh, the structure, if you will, is a, an overview of the current version of, of the revisions to the current plan. And again, I'm calling this an executive summary, please. Again, this is Attorney Karen Browning. On behalf of the applicant, Reverdy Energy, uh, this is a proposed solar project on Frontier Road. Uh, the zoning is manufacturing. The solar use is allowed by right. Um, we do have several um, persons here to testify and or answer questions. Um, however, given uh, your chair's instructions and, and we are in full agreement, we will try to move uh, through the information as efficiently as possible. Um, to that end, I would ask Dave Russo from Dupree Engineering to give an overview of the current plan. David, are you out there? Dave, you have to press star nine, please. All right, go ahead. Do you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, David Russo, a professional engineer with the Preed Engineering uh, to Stafford Court, uh, Cranston, Rhode Island. Uh, so as the chair requested, I'll give a real uh, brief overview. Uh, the application uh, is proposing a 9.25 megawatt AC uh, ground mount uh, solar system. Uh, we're proposing uh, the, the system would be surrounded by a seven foot uh, fence. Uh, access to the development uh, will utilize the existing curb cuts uh, that we utilize as part of the uh, golf pavilion that was constructed. Uh, we currently uh, have a uh, pending application with DEM in regards to the stormwater. Uh, we've analyzed the site and upgraded uh, the ponds on the site to conform to the, the new regulations. Uh, the town engineer, Crossman Engineering, has completed a thorough review of the project. We've been working with them for the past few months on this. Uh, it's on our understanding that the, the drainage and the engineering design component um, has been um, completed. Some of the outstanding items, um, there's a well located on the property. Uh, that is a, a well that serviced the restaurant, which is no longer active. Uh, Crossman Engineering uh, brought about that there, if that well was active, the Department of Health would uh, require a radius on that. Uh, we're not in disagreement with that. The applicant's working with the uh, Department of Health in regards to that. And prior to any uh, building permit, that, that will be resolved with the state. There's also uh, existing utility poles located on the east side of the property, on our property, uh, with an easement. Uh, we designed the plan, uh, assuming National Grid will allow those to be relocated within the roadway. The applicant is also working with National Grid on the relocation of those poles. Um, if either agency, um, we can't move the poles or Department of Health requires a radius, the applicant will uh, remove panels uh, in those areas. Um, the decommissioning estimate, uh, the pre-engineering prepared a decommissioning estimate, which we submitted. Uh, that included uh, an analysis by We Recycle Solar, who are experts in uh, recycling of solar panels. And we used those values. And then we included um, our estimates for labor seeding, um, minor erosion, and as-built, and engineering and over uh, oversight. Uh, we came up with a price of uh, $266,837. Uh, the town engineer uh, prepared their own uh, decommissioning estimate. Uh, they included uh, similar items, and their estimate came out to $278,064. Uh, those two estimates uh, were in the range of each other, and the applicant has found the town engineer's um, estimate uh, to be acceptable. Uh, 
And then the fire department, we met with the fire department uh, in the early phases of this, uh, back in December. We sent the fire department the most recent plans. Uh, they're aware of the project. Uh, they've spoken with the town planner and they're planning on completing a uh, final or final review, assuming uh, all town approvals are granted. Um, and that was uh, coordinated with uh, the town planner, as I stated. Uh, interconnection for this development will be located at the first entrance, uh, which goes to the former restaurant. Uh, there'll be above ground utility poles entering the site after the above ground utility poles throughout the site. Uh, all, all the electric will uh, be underground. Uh, the solar field layout conforms to all the zoning uh, ordinance setbacks. Uh, we provided a foot setback to all the residential zones, uh, which is the eastern side of the site and the uh, northern side of the site. And that's reflected on uh, the most uh, current plans. Uh, the development also, uh, <laughs> the plans presented are a, a class one survey that was prepared by Dupreet Engineering and the wetland flagging on the site uh, was prepared by Natural Resources Services and uh, Scott Rabideau. Uh, just for the sake of time, that's a general overview of the uh, project and where we stand uh, currently. Outstanding, thank you. So from the applicant's perspective, are we good or may I, may I move on to Crossman's comments and overview of their interpretation? Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. If I could make a request, would it be possible um, while the applicant is presenting for um, me to remain um, unmuted? Yes, Karen, I, I haven't been muting you. You've been muting yourself. Then, it, then if that's my mistake, I, I will try to correct that. Um, Don't worry about um, it. <laughs> to your question, um, just uh, one question for Mr. Russo for the record. Um, Mr. Russo, is it your testimony that the application um, before the board tonight conforms to the applicable town standards and ordinance requirements? Yes, it does. Um, and also for the record, uh, through the chair, I uh, request that all reports, plans, and updates submitted uh, to this point uh, be made part of the record. Of course. Um, now, Sage Engineering, Public Archaeology Labs, and NRS reports um, and their updates have also been submitted. Uh, Nicole Melanthi and John Clark from Sage Environmental are here to testify as to the environmental impact and the requested materials that were requested on um, uh, environmental impact. Would the chair prefer uh, that we go forward with that testimony or move to Kaufman? So. Again, subject to uh, any contrary thoughts by my colleagues, my thinking would be along these lines. When we get to the planning board's inquiries concerning the myriad of topics that could conceivably come up, but things like general layout, landscaping, decommissioning, et cetera, I think if there's a question for those experts, then that would be the time to have them present testimony. So in the instance where no one has a question uh, for those experts, uh, I would be suggesting that their written reports would stand as the record. What do you think? I'm sorry. Sorry, apologies. I, apologies. I, was, I was somehow muted again. I got kicked off, and, but I'm back now. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I agree um, with the caveat that there may be um, an instance in which um, I may want to question uh, one or more uh, of the, uh, the uh, applicant's witnesses. And that's perfectly acceptable. Please uh, appreciate that. I'm certainly not trying to uh, squelch your, uh, your, your abilities to get things onto the record. I'm simply looking to uh, keep us in line with our time frame. Uh, agree. Okay. And I would submit. Go ahead. Okay. Then I would submit that we move forward with uh, Crossman. Excellent. So, uh, if Crossman's representative is in the audience, uh, 
I'd be looking for your comments or interpretation as to the current status of the revisions to the plan. And again, I'm going to categorize this as an executive summary, please. Please press star nine so I can recognize you. All right, Steve. So oh, good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm Steve Cabral with an engineer with Costman Engineering. And what I'll do is I'll just quickly summarize the, the, the status of our comments. And basically, our last official memo is dated June 24th, 2020. And because of the timing of the submissions, we didn't submit a new memo based upon the plans that are dated July 7th. But what I'll do is I'll just quickly give you an executive summary of how our comments stand. And many of them, uh, David of Dupree did, did already mention, but I'll, I just want to point them out because they are concerns that we have. Uh, number one is that on the east side of the property, there's an existing overhead uh, electric power line that cuts through an area where there'll be solar panels. And the reason we pointed that out is we know that that power line has to be relocated in order for the panels to be installed. So we just want to make sure that if and where those lines are relocated, it basically if it will results in additional clearing that's not depicted on the plan, we want to make sure that the town is made aware of that before construction occurs. So. So that easement is still a, a pending is, issue, and as David mentioned, they're, they're working on it. That number two has to do with the, the well that, that provides water to the restaurant, which is now not, not open. The issue is that because of the restaurant use, uh, the applicant had to obtain a, a public well permit. Basically, it's called a transient non-community public water system. And that permit to operate that well exists. Whether or not the restaurant is open or closed isn't the issue. It's the fact that there is a public well permit and the state has a 200 foot and a 400 foot protective radius that, that's centered on the well. And we understand that because this is development plan review, the applicant doesn't need to have all of their state permits in advance. But the reason we, we mention this is that in the town solar ordinance, it does state that the design has to meet all local, state, and federal standards. So in order to build the solar field as depicted, the applicant would have to avoid their public well permit, that, or they'd have to get approval from the, the state Department of Health to install the solar panels in that protective radius. Now, in the past, we have been a consultant to the, the Department of Health, and it's our opinion from experience that DOH, the Department of Health, is not in favor of solar panels inside the protective radius. So, for me, it's our opinion that in order to meet the town solar ordinance, which requires conforming to state regulations, we really can't have the panels in the protective radius unless that well was that well permit was voided. Okay, the the third item are the landscape plans. And on past solar projects, the buffering has been provided with an abundance of vegetation and plantings of, of different heights and materials. On this project, most of the landscape buffering is with a stockade fence. And so we at first questioned that, but in the town ordinance, it does state that the applicant has an option of installing a fence in lieu of, in lieu of plantings. But I would like to point out that also in the ordinance, there's a phrase that states that the planning board may require vegetation to be used for understory cover that may serve to further screen the project. So even though I do agree that the landscape design does meet what's required in the ordinance. I believe the ordinance does give the planning board some authority to, you know, to require additional plantings if they feel it, it's necessary. Okay, the fourth item I had mentioned in the June 24, 2020 
memo is the operation and maintenance plan. Those issues have been addressed. Number five was the decommissioning cost estimate. And in the ordinance, basically it states that the town's engineer is to review and find an opinion and basically review the applicant's uh, estimate. So we did review the applicant's estimate, but we went a little a step further and we actually prepared our own independent estimate just to see if the order of magnitude of numbers were, were in line. And the, the primary question that, that we always had was, in the ordinance, it states that the decommissioning shall include the total removal of the PSES, including any underground and above ground utility structures, et cetera. The, the unknown item that's not clear in the town ordinance is whether or not we're allowed to subtract the salvage value of the material. We do admit and we do agree that there in all likelihood will be a salvage value. But in the wording of the ordinance, it's not clear if that can be included because in the ordinance, it just mentions the costs. Okay, number six, we had a comment about infiltration pond A. That's an infiltration pond in the northwest corner. Those comments were addressed. Number seven, we had a concern with the outlet pipes, basically a low flow outlet riser. Those comments have been addressed. Infiltration pond B was another concern, which is in the northeast corner. And our primary concern with infiltration pond B was the original landscape plan showed that there would be a trees planted on the detention, the infiltration ponds embankment. And over time, the root growth tends to impact the stability of the embankment. And in the latest plans, the landscape designer did a good job. They removed all of the trees on the berm and actually moved them to the southerly side of Pond B. So our comment eight has been addressed. Comment nine in the June 24th 20 memo had to do with infiltration Pond B. D, I'm sorry, infil infiltration Pond D. And those concerns have been addressed. And uh, what I'd like to do is take a quickly take a step back. This site was originally permitted by DEM as a recreational golf facility. And when that golf facility was designed and permitted, there were approximately three infiltration detention ponds that were permitted. And during the review process in working with the applicant, who was very informative and responded to every request we made, we found that those ponds were not built in accordance with the original DEM permit. So one of the benefits of this project is that the applicant is actually going to be upgrading all of those detention ponds that were never built properly. So there will be a benefit over existing conditions just by bringing those original ponds into conformance. Okay, back to my June memo, number 10 was infiltration pond C, which is at the southwest corner. Through a series of iterations, the applicant has addressed our concerns by raising the height of the embankment. The only remaining item that I spoke as recently as this morning with the designer, and he's agreed to do it, is that infiltration pond C, there's a piping network that actually flows to infiltration pond F, which is at the extreme southwest corner. And uh, the applicant has stated that they have surveyed all of the drain lines in that area, and they've confirmed that it was built in accordance with the original golf course design. But our observation of the latest plans is that survey data wasn't depicted on the plan. So all we're asking is that the survey data that has been performed be added to the plan just so that we can all see that the piping network was built in accordance with the original design. Uh, num number 11 had to do with, we were recommending stone trenches being built parallel to the slope in areas where the solar arrays were running perpendicular to the contours. Now, the reason we requested that is in a typical solar field, 
the solar arrays run parallel to the slope. So as the rainfall cascades off the panels, they flow in a sheet flow through the grass below. But in this case, we have areas where the solar arrays run actually perpendicular to the slope. So we were concerned that as the water cascaded off the panels, we would have a linear flow running along the face of the, the solar arrays, which would increase the likelihood of erosion. So to resolve that, the applicant, the designer, agreed to install periodic stone trenches that would run parallel to the slope, perpendicular to, to the solar arrays. And this resolves that concern because as water reaches those intermittent stone channels, the water will be able to disperse throughout the stone. Okay, number 12, access. When, when we view the plan, there seems to be limited access for emergency vehicles to access all of the arrays. So we understand that that's in the hands of the fire marshal, but as of today, we have not seen comments from the fire marshal, so we don't know if his concerns are satisfied. And actually, that's, I believe that's where we stand as of today. And I, and I will state, we've been working with the applicant and their designer for probably four to five months now, and it's never been an issue where they would push back and fight when we had a suggestion. As with other projects, they always actively work with us to resolve the concern. So I, I do, I would like to give credit to the applicant for, for doing that. Very good, Steve, thank you very much. Okay, so my next thought would be, this would be an opportunity for the planning board to raise any questions or concerns that they might have. Now, before we get into that, let me add just a little bit more structure to that idea. It sounds to me, as I look over my notes, that if we use the Crossman uh, memo, and that's the memo of June 24th, these items break down into three general categories. The layout, general layout of the proposal, the landscaping, and decommissioning. So while there are many items, I think they fit into these categories nicely. So what I would be suggesting to the planning board is we would open our discussion, for an example, about overall layout. And I would ask that all the members provide their input, comments, concerns, questions about the general layout of the proposal. Then we would move on to the next general topic, landscaping, do the same thing, and on and on. So rather than bounce back and forth, we kind of keep it into uh, small containers, but while we're dealing with that particular topic, this is when I would ask the planning board members to get everything that they have out on the table. So planning board members, what do you think about that idea? I find it acceptable. Thank you, Ron. Sounds good to me. This is Carolyn, um, agreed. Keith, you out there? All right, I'll take that as a consensus. So, planning board members, on the topic of the overall layout, that is the current plan, let's have your comments, questions, or concerns. Okay, Ron here. Uh, I'd like to applaud both Steve Cabral and uh, Dave Russo for working together as diligently as they have. Uh, I have no concerns. It seems like they're both operating in a professional manner and they've come to an equitable agreement. Okay, Ron, thank you. You're welcome. This is Carolyn. I have a question for you, Al. Yes. When, when you say comment on the overall plan, 
does that take into can we bring up an um, issue like the setback? Uh, yes, because that's on the plan. So, for example, in my notes, not to interrupt, but my notes, things like Steve brought up the issue of the overhead utility lines. He's got an issue on the uh, well servicing the former restaurant. These would all be items that I think should be open to question as we talk about the general layout. So if there's something on the plan, the setback, uh, again, anything that's on the plan, this would be the opportunity to deal with. Okay, then on that note, I would like to say that I would like to see an increase in the setback all around the project design to a minimum of 100 feet. Okay, and can you elaborate on your reasoning, please? I'm thinking out of the box. I'm thinking of the sea of solar projects that are occurring in this particular neighborhood. Uh, we don't have anything official on the board for what's going on with Ashway Investments across the street, but Mr. Palumbo has already put us on notice that there is a plan for a project across the street on Main Street. Um, with all of this development, it's clear to me that with the weather changes, et cetera, there is need to be concerned about exposure of the project to the neighborhood. Uh, one of my comments, well, this particular comment also includes uh, the area that abuts Madison Hill, where we have all, a limited 100-foot setback, but further in the plans, we see that they are uh, considering the need for a sound barrier. I have a question about the sound barrier. Why would we need, uh, why would we potentially need a sound barrier? So in my mind, it's looking like the setback should be considered in I would also like them to talk about the potential need for that sound barrier. Mr. Chair, could we respond? Yes, I think I was just about to say, I think it's appropriate that when a question comes up, a question or a concern, uh, absolutely, you should, you should be the one to respond to that inquiry. So this is your opportunity. Okay, so as to the setback, um, we, we, hear the, we hear the comment, it's something that I know we've heard um, more than once um, on this project, um, and I, I have to say again that this project lies with your ordinance, um, and that is as to every respect, including setback. Um, we hear the concern about the exposure uh, to neighbors. Um, I would respectfully ask that at this time, um, we be allowed to present a short testimony from Tom Sweeney, uh, who we have engaged to um, research and opine on this very issue. I'll just have to press star nine so I can recognize him. Uh, with all due respect, I wasn't questioning real estate values. Yeah, I'm, I'm with that comment too. I, I'm not quite sure I see the validity of a real estate, if I have that correct, a real estate appraiser coming in to testify concerning the setbacks. Please. With all due respect, yeah, with, with all due respect, your uh, ordinance and requirements uh, do say that uh, part of your review uh, is to determine that the use is compatible with surrounding land uses and that there's a, there's a sufficient um, effort to minimize any adverse impact on adjacent land uses. Um, I think it's important to hear from Mr. Sweeney um, as to uh, both of those um, ordinance requirements. I'm, this is Carolyn again. I, you know, it's taken us so long to get this far, and I think unless there's a direct comment to or towards the 75-foot buffers, and there's an empty lot across the street right now. I would prefer that you respond to my question about the potential sound barrier. Well, I think, with, again, with all due respect, there were three points raised. 
one on the increased setbacks, one on the exposure to neighbors, and then to the sound barriers. We have Sage here that can absolutely answer your question on sound barriers at the end. But I, again, um, for purposes of this application uh, and for the record, uh, it is important that we be allowed to move forward with this testimony from Mr. Sweeney. Yes, uh, uh, Jim, Jim Lamphere has a comment. Yes, uh, Jim Lamphere, town planner. Um, as long as the issue of setbacks is being raised, I think it's appropriate for me to weigh in on it uh, now so we can get that straight. Um, in the in interest of being consistent with how we've looked at solar, all the solar projects to date in this town. The ordinance says that setbacks will, um, the, the setbacks for the underlying zone will apply to PSES. We have never um, used the requirement that's in the zoning ordinance for um, commercial or manufacturing structures to be at least 100 feet away from a residential zone. I see that that's something that they've put on this plan on their own, um, but we've never, we've never used that. But um, I would like to mention <clears throat> that in the northern part of this uh, array, right by where the wetlands are, there is an access road. And the way we have interpreted access roads in the past is they are part of the PSES and that access roads are not supposed to be in the setback. So I guess my question is to the applicant here, um, it, th th they are claiming a hundred foot setback, which I don't think they really need to if that's a, um, uh, I'm not even sure what, what that is right now, whether it's a side yard or a rear yard, it doesn't really, it's not labeled as such, but if, it, if you're gonna use 75 feet, for example, um, of, a, um, of a rear yard, um, the edge of that road is 75 feet from the property line. Now, if the, if the planning board wants to impose a greater setback on this, which by our legal advice here, uh, they're advised that they can go to a maximum of 100 feet for a setback. Um, if, if the 100 foot setback applies as it's shown on that plan, then that access road has to be moved outside of that. Uh, if, it's, if, if you're gonna use 75 feet or 50 feet for a setback there, I believe the road is fine where it is. So that's my comment on setbacks here. Very good, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Jim. Uh, so uh, again, I understand that there's some pending testimony. Uh, li listen, as I mentioned before, I'm not trying to squash anyone's ability to put things on the record. Uh, I'm prepared to allow the testimony, but I've got to tell you that the focus of that has got to be on setbacks. It's not a, this is not a wide open invitation to start talking about real estate values in the area. That's not, that's not the question that was raised. Are we clear? Well, well just I, 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 I hear the comment, but in response to that, um, I think there were three points raised, um, and one was certainly to setbacks. One was exposure to the neighbors, which raises the issue of, of effect on the surrounding area and adverse impact on adjacent land uses. And those are things that this applicant has prepared reports, has testimony ready to address those standards. It's important that the applicant be given the opportunity to present that testimony so that there's evidence in the record in support of those standards. The third, as to the sound barrier, again, we can get to that and we do have um, Sage here to testify as to that. So the setback issue is, is part of it, but I think the bigger issue is the exposure to the neighbors, which was an issue that was raised. Okay, I'm prepared to allow the testimony. I'm going to caution you that please this, have this expert be as brief and concise as possible. Go ahead, Mr. Sweeney. Thank you. Thomas Sweeney, uh, One Turk's Head Place, Providence, Rhode Island. Um, Ms. Browning, I'm not sure if you just want me to. Yeah, uh, Mr. Sweeney and um, the chair, would, would we like to swear this witness? 
Mr. Sweeney, are you going to tell us the truth? I, I am, Mr. Chairman. Here we go. Consider yourself sworn. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the board, Mr. Sweeney's report and resume is in the record at uh, four. Um, could you state your name and um, our position uh, for the record, Mr. Sweeney? Sure. Thomas, middle initial O, Sweeney. I'm a principal with Sweeney Real Estate and Appraisal in Providence, Rhode Island. And would you very briefly go through your background for us? Uh, I've been involved in real estate for over 35 years. I'm a certified real estate appraiser in the state of Rhode Island and a licensed real estate broker in both Massachusetts and Rhode Island. I've appeared in front of most, if not all, zoning boards and many planning boards throughout the state of Rhode Island, having been accepted as an expert witness uh, in front of them and in front of most of the courts, including federal district, superior court, family court, and federal bankruptcy court. Uh, Mr. Chair, in the, in the interest of moving things along, I ask that this witness be uh, qualified as an expert in real estate values and appraisal. Consider that done. Mr. Sweeney, are you Thank familiar you. with the application that has been submitted? I am. And did you have a chance to visit the site? I did on a number of occasions uh, recently and throughout my years. In the, uh, I'm familiar with it just from general knowledge. And you're, you're also uh, then familiar with the surrounding neighborhood? I am. Uh, did you review the plan set that's been submitted inclusive of the landscape plan? I did. And did you do any other research? Uh, besides my general investigation of the site and the neighborhood surrounding it, I also did some additional research, in, uh, internet research into finding uh, studies that have been done about the impact of solar farms on surrounding residential properties. And what did you find? Uh, I found three different studies. While none have been completed in Rhode Island and Massachusetts, uh, the three most current uh, studies have been done uh, in North Carolina and Illinois, and I can't think of the third site, city right, state right now, but all three utilizing paired sales um, have concluded that uh, solar arrays do not have negative impact on uh, surrounding residential properties. So in your expert opinion, um, is the proposed solar use compatible with the surrounding land uses? It, it is. It, it's a non-intrusive use. Uh, the applicant is uh, uh, proposing screening on, on all sides, uh, in my opinion, uh, with the screening and based upon the studies I've seen in the neighborhood in general, there will be no negative impact. And is it your expert opinion uh, that the proposed plan is sufficient to minimize any adverse impact on adjacent land uses? Uh, in my opinion, it is. The screening is a manufacturing zone. Um, I believe the applicant has, has proposed uh, enough screening to limit the, the limit, if any, impact on the surrounding properties, which I don't think there will be. And finally, is it your opinion that approval of this application will not substantially or permanently injure the appropriate use of the property and surrounding area? It, it is. I believe that the applicant has addressed the, the screening and buffering issues uh, to uh, screen the property, the, the use from the surrounding residential uses primarily. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. That's all I have. Um, Mr. Chair, at this time, does it make sense to have uh, SAGE Environmental respond to the question on sound barriers? Excuse me, keeping consistent with, with, with what Al offered at the beginning of the meeting, I think now's the time for us to question the expert. Agreed. Absolutely. Any questions for Mr. Sweeney? Sure. Plenty Mr. Board Sweeney. Oh, sorry, go, go ahead. <laughs> Carolyn talking. <laughs> um, Mr. Sweeney, this, I'm, I'm going to dig into your research in other states. Uh, were those projects conducted in neighborhoods that already had 134 acres worth of solar panels in the neighborhood? Uh, I mean, I'm sure you took a right at the end of Frontier and went about a mile and, you know, saw impact there. Yeah. And I'm 
I agree that the development of this project isn't going to impact real estate values in the neighborhood any more than it already has been impacted. Um, I believe that the projects that were analyzed, and, and I don't have the exact studies in front of me right now, but I believe all the projects that were analyzed were significantly larger than what is proposed even here. Uh, that is a sidestep. Uh, I specifically, and I don't need you to answer this, but I'm specifically saying the neighborhood already has over 130 acres of solar panels in it. So any impact to real estate values from this project is nominal. So I don't see the value in what you're presenting. And when I say the neighborhood, I'm not talking about physical houses. I'm talking about the traffic community. I'm talking about everything that happens in a neighborhood. I'm, I'm, right I'm not here. sure, I'm not sure how I should respond to that. <laughs> okay, so it doesn't have I to don't be. Think Sorry, Al Dior, it doesn't have to be a debate. Uh, Carolyn, if you've got, you got what you needed, great. Otherwise, you know, folks are going to stand where they stand, right? Thank you. Any other questions of this expert? Planning Board. Ron Prelowitz here. I have no questions. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. Okay. That's Keith Winslow. It's just more of a comment and not to discredit the, the realtor in his opinion, but until something's been sold in that neighborhood, that's the true value in the future, and we don't have that. So it's, it's just an opinion that we either choose to agree with or not agree with. That's my opinion. Very good. Thank you. All right, let me go back to uh, Carolyn's recommendation. Let me first make sure that I understand your, your thought, Carolyn. You're suggesting a 100-foot setback surrounding the property. Do I have that correct? Yes. Okay, so as I look at the site plan, I'm seeing that the applicant has already proposed, uh, with the exception of Jim's relevant comment, uh, the better part of a 100-foot setback on the north and yep. easterly sides of the project, leaving uh, the southerly Frontier Road and the, let me call it westerly interstate sides at something less than 100. Uh, am I interpreting that correctly, Carolyn? Yes. So, are you seeking to increase the 75 to 100 along an interstate? Yes. Okay. I want to be clear. And then to the applicant, do you have a question about the 100 foot sack? And I, I fully appreciate our embracing at least our thought process on this. Is it your intention to maintain the 100 foot setback in a vegetated condition? Is this for me, Carolyn? This is, this is for the applicant. Yeah. Okay. I think we're waiting for uh, Mr. Russo and Mr. Palumbo to raise their hand and be unmuted, if that's possible. All right. Dave, go ahead. Uh, Dave Russo, Decreed Engineering. So, as uh, the chair stated, we provided a hundred setback along the eastern edge of uh, Mac Hill Road. We've proposed a, uh, a landscape berm along that entire stretch to buffer the system, uh, to visually buffer it. The vegetation between that visual buffer and the, the roadway, uh, the proposal is to uh, remove the large trees that could cast shade on the system and the low-lying vegetation uh, does not need to be removed. 
uh, as you move north to where the existing infiltration basin is, the berm, the landscape berm carries um, in that area slightly and then it converts to uh, vegetation or planted vegetation for screening. And we've held that 100 foot setback all along the southern property line of uh, 55A. And then as you get to the western um, side of lot 55A, uh, where Mr. Lanfear uh, commented, we, we've shown the solar panels uh, 100 feet away. Uh, the roadway uh, meets the, the underlying zoning setback of 50 feet. And we've also proposed a uh, you know, berm in that area to visually screen uh, that section of the development. As you go to the north, the wetland area is there buffering the, the northern section of the property. And then as you get towards the western line, which abuts Interstate 95, the panel, uh, panels are set back a minimum of 75 feet from the interstate on-ramp. Along that entire stretch along the interstate, there's a landscape berm that will visually screen uh, the panels in that area. That landscape berm carries uh, all the way down the western uh, property line uh, towards the uh, entrance of the development. And then along the southern line of Frontier Road, there's an existing wetland and buffer. Um, those panels on the southern line are much greater than even 100 feet off of Frontier Road and all of that vegetation in that wetland is to remain uh, and it has a very thick uh, existing buffer along that uh, southern edge. Good, thank you, David. So, Carolyn, getting back to your comment, I would like to endorse it. However, I, I, in light of what the applicant has already put forth, I, I would be focused more on requiring vegetation in the current 100 foot setback and we'll get around to talking about this berm we talk about landscaping but along the interstate i would be looking for vegetation and not necessarily an additional 25 foot of buffer that as much as i like to screen projects from the interstate because i consider that a an important visual impact i i don't know what an additional 25 feet of linear space to do that vegetative buffer couldn't accomplish. What are your thoughts? Carolyn. Hi, I'm here. Um, I agree, but my, my question is to the berm that uh, is along that western line on 95. Who owns that? Is that Who the owns state? The berm? The berm would yeah. the berm would be on our on our property. The berm, it, the current berm uh, along that exit ramp that's on your property. We'd be proposing a berm. Pardon the interruption, uh, Mr. Palumbo has also been unmuted. If you would like to weigh in in, in regards as, as well as Dave, you are able to do so. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm with, here. I'm with Carolyn right now. Please. I want to hear the rest of your thoughts. I mean, we're going to get around okay. to the berm. I'd like to discuss the berm under landscaping. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Let's, let's just try and focus on the magnitude of the setbacks. That was your okay. question. Okay. So, so my thoughts are, you're right, Al, 75-foot vegetated buffer on the west is agreeable. Vegetated buffer. Uh, but one of the comments that was made is that there's an existing berm there. I'm not talking about the new berm. What I'm asking is the existing berm, does that belong to the state of Rhode Island or is that a piece of land that the developer can promise is never going to change? That, that berm so, is, is close to the property. I would say the top of that berm is close I'm to sorry, the who's property. Speaking? I'm sorry, can I get uh, sorry. speaking? This My apologies. David yep. Russo with the engineer. Thank you. Thank you. That, that berm that you're speaking about, the top of it is really close to the property line. Um, so there's uh, quite a bit of existing vegetation that's on the state land that the applicant cannot touch and will remain in that area. 
And on our property, there's quite a bit of vegetation that we're not proposing to touch, and the berm is going on the inside of that vegetated area. So you're proposing an additional berm on the west side along the on-ramp? Uh, on the east side, yeah, if you're driving on the on-ramp, it'd be on your east, on your right side. And that came to about because at the pre-application meeting, it was stressed multiple times that they that the board did not want to see this field. So to achieve that, the berm, okay. we, we felt the berm was the best option. Okay, so you're, you're going to be installing additional berm in that area. So that answers my question regarding the 75-foot rear setback. So, I agree. Uh, I'm satisfied that the 75 foot rear yard setback is acceptable now that it's been clarified that there is going to be additional berm provided uh, to keep the uh, visual impact uh, where it is with none. <laughs> Aldiorio again. So, in in addition, we may end up discussing additional landscaping in that area. So to summarize, Carolyn, you're okay with 75 feet on the west. Uh, I, am okay yeah. with, I am okay with the applicant's 100-foot uh, setback around the rest of the site with a couple of additional considerations. Number one, you've got to move that roadway outside of the 100-foot setback. This is the roadway, uh, let me say, uh, it's running generally northeasterly and ends up at the northerly wetland. That road access roadway has to be relocated to the west. In addition, when we talk about the 100 foot setback, I'm visualizing this as a vegetated area. So you can talk about removing the large trees. Yes, I get that. You can talk about removing the understory. Yes, I get that. But there will be the necessity for a vegetated landscape plan in that area so as to screen the site. Carol, Carolyn, are we on the same page? Yes, we are. Okay. Any other planning board members care to weigh in on what I'm going to consider the general layout? Yes, I'd like to make a comment, please. Ron, go right ahead. I, I agree with Chairman DiOrio and with uh, Carolyn that the 75 feet is adequate because it's still quite a ways from the on-ramp. And at that point, anybody that has any driving etiquette at all, they're more interested in looking to their left to see if they can actually merge with the traffic than looking at the berm. Uh, I, I agree that the 75 feet is adequate with the proposed screening. Good comment, Ron. Thank you. Any other planning board members on this yes, particular? Keith, I agree. Sorry that the, uh, the, the buffering is more important than the setback. Okay, are we good on the setbacks? We're good on setbacks. This is Emily. I have another just general plan comment. Yes, it's appropriate to bring it up now. Okay. Um, so actually what I'm about to bring up, I, I realize there might be some pros and cons. There might be some discussion here. I'm very curious what the other board members think. Um, my comment is about the grading and cutting that we talked about very briefly two weeks ago. I appreciate that. Um, the applicant was able to get another um, further opinion and ideas from Sage, uh, the consultant, and that's included in the packet that we have here, a July 7th letter about the environmental impact statement revision and update. Um, what I'm trying to reconcile is the statement there um, that they made uh, on July 7th that says, if groundwater is found, grading modifications may occur the cut area would be reduced, the location of the solar equipment would remain unchanged. And I'm trying to reconcile this with our uh, development plan review standards under soil erosion and stormwater control that say, 
construction and other development plans calling for cutting and filling or stripping of vegetation may not be approved by the planning board if it is determined that the proposed land uses could be supported with less alteration of the natural terrain and vegetation. So it seems to me that Sage's letter states just that, that they're able to install these solar panels without doing this extraordinary cutting that might render the groundwater, you know, a little bit more susceptible or vulnerable to alteration. So um, first of all, I'm curious if, if that's something that could be agreed to. But I also recognize that if they're not going to do such drastic cutting, we're talking about, you know, they're talking about removing like eight feet of material here. The panels are now going to be eight feet higher or some other height higher, right? So they're not going to be able to cut down some of these hummocky areas that were artificial fill anyway. Um, so I'm not really concerned about like altering the natural landscape. I'm concerned about the exposure of the groundwater. So if you're not going to do this cutting, the panels are going to be higher up. It's already uh, you know, a higher elevation part of the property, is that going to render them more exposed? And is that more undesirable of an outcome than having vulnerable groundwater? Um, that is, that's my question, sort of framing that for the discussion. But I think maybe first I'm, I'm curious if the applicant agrees they're able to do what they need to do um, and install panels without doing this very drastic cutting. Uh, if I could respond, it's Dave Russo. So the the upper the upper area on the east side of this property, um, as you stated, was heavily developed as a golf course. Um, part of the installation with the solar panels is you can have slopes, but they can't be as drastic as that manufactured golf course was. Um, so a lot of the larger cuts in that area are to remove a lot of these mounds that were created for that practice facility in that area. Um, the statement that Sage made is, you know, there, and this is any construction, um, you, we could potentially go out there and one area might be slightly different. We might have to modify the grading very slightly, but we're not expecting uh, to modify it very significantly. And what we've shown on the plan is what we plan on building. Um, and the material, the, what we envision with the material on site is a lot of the material that's um, on the east side of the site that was created with the golf course, uh, we envision a lot of that being pushed um, onto the uh, steep slope that goes from the east to the west to try to make that slope a uh, consistent slope so that the panels, when they're installed, have a consistent slope and they don't, they're not wavy in nature um, and, and, you know, they don't go up and down because the, the natural terrain out there, because it's a manufactured golf area, it does have a lot of up and down and undulation. So um, we believe the grading plan that we created um, will be able to be constructed, but with any construction, um, you may run into some field modifications that may need to be made. And Al Diorio, let me just interject. Emily, if I understand your concern, that is exactly what is ringing our bell. Uh, we understand fully that construction projects undergo on-site modifications. The complexity here is the planning board isn't going to know about those. So I would, I would somehow like to have a mechanism where there's some oversight uh, on behalf of the town to ensure that we don't have compromised gr groundwater. And if that means inspections by the town engineer, which I, I believe are already incorporated, I, I'm somewhat comfortable. Uh, Emily, what do you think? Yeah, I think that inspections are critical for this issue. I guess my, my concern is that, you know, cutting occurs groundwater becomes exposed or vulnerable. Um, really, the engineering uh, information that's provided here, um, you know, you got to a certain depth, didn't find groundwater, but I assume you're going to be dri you're driving stakes deeper than the depth that you were able to explore to and to sample. So it's just such a high likelihood that something could happen. I think this is a really critical area of the site that we somehow need to come up with a framework where we're, we're kept, 
you know, really abreast of what's happening or that the engineer, I see that the engineer, our town engineer is going to be on site every two weeks. I mean, if we can figure out how to ensure that they're there throughout this phase of the construction where this area of the site is being worked on, um, basically to keep an eye on how things might be modified, um, I think that's really critical. Emily, would you be comfortable with uh, an idea or somewhere along the line of uh, rather than create an inspection program that's done by time, an inspection program by the town engineer based on what's happening on the site? For example, yeah. if there's a cut that exceeds, pick a number, four feet, the town engineer has to be notified. Right. Yeah, I, I think that's a good idea. Okay. Does that alleviate your concern about the grading? Yes. We'll certainly get to the issue of panels being higher than we anticipated and therefore more visible when we get around to talking about landscaping. Anything else on general layout? Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Attorney Browning. Um, if I could just make one point. Um, to, in response to the concern about monitoring, uh, the ordinance does allow for inspections at any time already. So I'm not sure that a further condition would be necessary. The applicant is already subject to those inspections at any time. Thank you very much for that thought. Unfortunately, I'm a big conditions guy. So you're likely to get a whole bunch of them. So yes, we're simply. And looking as long as they're consistent with the ordinance, Mr. Chair, we we, we probably won't have an objection. I'm sure that you won't. We will be consistent. Hey, this is Carolyn. Before we move off of that, can we get back to addressing the need for a potential sound barrier? I think the applicant was on their way to uh, offering some kind of testimony. Is that correct? Uh, yes, we have um, representatives from Stage Environmental who can respond to that comment. I would say go right ahead. Please be brief. Yes, if you could just give us a moment for them to raise their hands. Hi, this is Nicole Melanifee from Sage Environmental. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm a registered special engineer in Rhode Hi. Island, and I had conducted the noise evaluation for the site. And as Caroline indicated, when we were doing the evaluation, we found that there was uh, potential for a need of a sound barrier that would go around the inverters for this site. Uh, because they're slightly larger, they emanate a slightly more sound. And so to keep with the conservative um, sound limitation of no sound exceeding 40 decibels out, off the property line, the modeling performed put a sound barrier that buried, went around each of the inverters, the larger inverters. So there's two types of inverters on the site. Um, the larger one being referred to as the FG250HX. And so on three sides of the inverter, we put sound barriers with an NRC rating of 0.2. What an NRC rating is, is it's the ability of material to absorb the sound. Um, so something like that would be comparable with a 0.2 um, rating would be wood, so a, a wood barrier around that. Um, it could be various different products, but as long as it's rated with an NRC of 0.2. And doing that reduces the sound uh, from the site to, to not exceed 40 decibels at the property line. The greatest sound was actually 37.7 uh, decibels. It's important to note that this modeling did not incorporate any of the landscaping firms that are part of this project. Uh, because it was being done at the same time that the berms were being created. So we excluded those from the noise modeling. And landscaping berms, because they're, in this case, they're higher than the location of the inverters and the transformers. And all the, so those are the two pieces of equipment um, or groups of equipment that would be emanating the sound. Those landscaping berms are going to absorb a lot of the sound emanating from the site. 
Um, according to DOT studies, landscaping firms can absorb up to 15 decibels, which that absorption is greater than the necessary absorption needed for with these wooden barriers that we had used in the modeling. So it's something that as the construction, after the site has been done, what we're proposing is that within 90 days of that, we do a environmental noise assessment where we go and we collect actual noise emanating from the site and determine if it does exceed that 40 decibels. And if it does, in those areas where it needs to be further reduced, the sound barriers would be placed around the inverter to then further reduce the sound. Um, so that that's a, a very quick and brief overview of, of the sound barriers and, and please if there's any questions, I'm open for questions. Okay, thank you, Nicole. This is Carolyn. I'm sorry, Al. Go right ahead, go right ahead. Uh, it doesn't seem practical that a sound barrier would be manufactured out of wood because it would be a fire hazard. But, but is this a traditional recommendation? I is it in the learn? So I, I, I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question. Is the question whether or not the wood would be a fire hazard to placing around the equipment? Yeah. So my understanding is no, because of the distance that it would be placed from there. But it would be something, the material of construction for the sound barrier, would, it would be evaluated to ensure that there is no safety concern. There are other uh, sound barrier options. Um, it, you know, there's a lot of, there's, you can go the route of jackets that are fire retardants that can go around there. Um, there's also these drape systems that are fire retardant. But the wooden fence is not expected to, to be because it's not going to be right on top of the equipment. There will be space between there based on the manufacturing recommendations of what needs to be, the distance that needs to be away from the equipment. And off the top of my head, we have, because I looked into verifying that, that we could use something of this nature. And um, I believe it was just a couple of feet that it needed to be from it. Okay. Carolyn, do you have an answer to your question? Yes, I do. Very good. Planning board members. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, if we don't have any more comments on that potential sound barrier from Dan Flynn and board members, I do I do have one question and it's probably me just not seeing it. I'm looking at sheet nine and we have transformer 1B, we have transformer 1C, but I'm not seeing transformer 1A. So I'm wondering, is that non-existent or am I missing it on the sheet? So I'm not looking at sheet nine right now, but it's right across. So um, if you look in the Western direction, right across from 1D. So there's that road that goes through the middle of the site, and it's right on the opposite side of that. I'm just opening up sheet nine right now so that I can be looking at the same one that you're looking at. So if you look at sheet eight, Okay, I see it. Okay, because it's actually um, the zoomed in. It would be found on sheet eleven. Is the is the more close up of of that? Okay, so we're at the, looking at one, two, three, four. Looking at sheet eight, it looks like there's four transformer pads. Okay. Good there? there? There's actually five. I see it. Okay. <laughs> there's, so it's, it's 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, and then 2A for the transformer okay. pads. But the, um, 
the inverters are not located on the, the transformer pads. They're actually located at the end of some of the rows on the inward into the property. Uh -huh. So if you look again on, on sheet A, you'll see there's small triangles. Those are the location of the inverters. And those are the locations specifically of, of the larger inverters where there would possibly need to be the sound barriers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions on barriers? Hearing none. Any other questions on general layout? I only have one, this is Oreo. It has to do with the well issue for the restaurant location. So I'm not quite sure who I'm directing the question to, but let me throw it out there and either David or perhaps Steve can help me out. So uh, I did a role in the, uh, some of the easement work for that restaurant facility. So I'm aware that the restaurant is currently not open. Uh, I'm fairly confident that the community would endorse that facility opening again. So it's probably not going to be dormant, and we're certainly not going to ask anybody to give up their uh, Department of Health permit for the well. So Steve suggested that in his experience, uh, having done similar work, that the solar panels would not be allowed in this radius. Now, first, the first question is, can somebody straighten me out as to how much area we're talking about if that well radius were to be respected first question and second question would be why haven't we simply pulled the panels out of the radius area already does somebody think that the department of health is going to render a contrary opinion uh, those are my two questions uh, whoever can help me out please uh dave russo with oh. the pre the the well location, um, it, we are not in disagreement with Crossman. Um, we, they're working, the applicant is working with DOH um, in regards to that with a few different options. Uh, one, uh, we've taken the stance showing the assumption that that well um, could potentially be relocated. Uh, you know, there's still a chance that that well may not be uh, needed to be a public well. Um, so we've taken the stance that we are showing the panels within the 200 foot radius that uh, DOH would, inf would enforce if it were to remain. If, and the applicant has agreed, if DOH, um, if that well is to remain, that they'll remove the panels and uh, as DOH requires. Um, so that's why we've shown the panels there. They're still working with DOH in regards to that. And prior to, um, you know, any building permit for this, that would have to, you know, be resolved and shown on the final plans, uh, what the final uh, design is in relation to that. So, that, uh, thank you very much. Appreciate that. So, I'm hearing that the Department of Health uh, recommendation as to what to do here has got to be incorporated on the final plan. So we're still working with essentially an, an interim plan. Would that be correct? Um, I don't know that that's correct. That it's not necessarily an interim plan. I think um, maybe better characterized as um, a plan subject to, to DOH's final review. Um, as indicated by Mr. Russo, there is an option to relocate the well. Um, and that is something that could be explored if um, Department of Health um, felt that, um, and the applicant couldn't come to some sort of an agreement. Um, but um, worst case for the applicant, they would have to simply remove the panels. Um, but in any case, uh, the applicant would have to comply with state law that includes Department of Health uh, prior to pulling a building permit. So I would respectfully ask that uh, we be allowed um, to continue to work with DOH and have this matter resolved um, by the time uh, building permit is requested. 
Uh, Mr. Well, Chairman, this is Ralph, Ralph Palomo. May I be here for a moment? Go ahead. Yes, of course. Go ahead. Yeah. So I, I, I think you're, you're right on point with your questions. And this is really a, a business decision. Um, from us, from everybody's standpoint, if the restaurant uh, shows that it can uh, become, re, re, revise itself and become economically functioning, uh, and it can maintain its responsibilities on the property. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, we will have to remove the panels, uh, not put panels there in the first place, not remove them, not put panels there in the first place, and respect the well. Uh, is, and that may happen. But if it, if it doesn't happen, um, and, and it can be uh, decided with full resolution before we start construction, we'll put panels there. Uh, and then the third option is, as Karen said, you know, we may uh, may find a way to put the well closer to uh, the restaurant that would uh, eliminate the need for the pump house in that section that it has been identified. So it's a multifaceted uh, decision process, but not, but not all the information uh, is readily available right now. Okay, I certainly appreciate the input, but I, I'm hearing some things that are a little bit different than what was initially represented. First of all, I don't particularly think I care for the idea that a decision like this is going to take place prior to the issuance of the building permit. That takes the planning board out of the loop. I'm not quite sure I like that idea. Secondly, well, I understand. Well, excuse, I understand. excuse me. Secondly, this idea of the viability of the restaurant, that, that, that was never discussed. I'm not going to do anything that compromises somebody else's viability to benefit your project. I don't know if that was your intimation, but that's certainly the way it sounded. No, I, I don't think that that was. Yeah. Yeah. That was Karen, my Karen, let me let me respond. You interpreted my statements incorrectly. Okay, I I don't, I don't plan to do anything to impair the restaurant. If they show that they're not going to perform, we have the ability. To put panels there. It's that simple. And if they do perform, then we don't put panels there. It's that simple. We're not asking you to do anything to help me or not help me. So it's, it's just that simple out. Mr. Chair, if I could add to that, um, state permits um, in this um, scenario with this DPR application are not required until um, the time of building permit. There's no requirement at this stage that state permits be in place. So we understand we have to provide them, and we will provide them, uh, but they will be provided at the appropriate time, which in this case is prior to a building permit. So that's what was meant by that comment. Hey, this is Carolyn. Can I ask a question? Go right ahead, Carolyn. Are the owners of the property involved in these negotiations with DOE? You're referring to the owners of the restaurant facility, Carolyn? Yeah. Applicant have an answer for that? They're not. Okay, then from my perspective, I don't think there's any opportunity for any of us, particularly me, my position is, there's no negotiation in how you manage somebody else's property and whether that restaurant is going to be viable. That is not part of the solution here. You're raising other questions and other problems that are completely inappropriate what, what the planning board is trying to accomplish. And if we were allow you to proceed, we would be allowing a terrible precedent to be set for future development. I think it's really inappropriate for you guys to have three options that are involving somebody else's property. If the if owners I, aren't involved, then who would bear the burden of moving this well? So not, if I could the respond. Of health, not the owner. So there, there I, is an I, agreement I else in place, Ms. Light. Ms. Light, there is an agreement that exists among um, the parties. Um, and that agreement would need to be abided by and govern the situation. So I want to be clear that um, it would not be setting uh, a precedent um, or, you know, violating a third party's rights. Uh, there's already agreement in place that protects that third party. 
then that agreement should have been introduced. Well, that's a, that, that's a private agreement among the parties that, that we would need to abide by. And, and, and really, um, the goal here is to uh, ensure that this application uh, conforms to uh, all of the Hopkinton Town ordinances um, and regulations, as this is, as you know, as this is DPR review, um, and also to abide by the Department of Health regulations so that we can get their, their stamp of approval on the project as well. Uh, both of those standards are uh, being met, and, and, and especially as the Department of Health uh, will have to be met um, before we can uh, break ground and, and do any sort of construction. Okay, I'm seeing a lack of transparency in what's occurring here with a well. It's not a, it's not a house, it's not a shed, it's a well. Um, and I, I appreciate your confidential agreement with a property owner, but I think there's a lack of transparency and I, I, I don't support that. So, Karen, I'm, I'm sorry, let me, uh, let me get in here. So, Karen, uh, Al Diorio, yes, sure. oops. I, 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 the, the town of council is going to be. Uh, I'm sorry, who's here. speaking? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, who's speaking? Davis, the, 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 okay, the yep. council um, liaison, town council liaison to the planning board. The town council is considering a liquor license for that property. So, I would think they would want their well to be, you know, in good order. And I think that uh, probably you do need to just go ahead and remove the panels. I'm sorry to interrupt, but that I just wanted to get that out. Thank you. Very good, Sharon. Thank you very much. Actually, you're right on point uh, in responding to your most recent comment and to Carolyn's concern. My suggestion here would be, listen, as a condition of the approval, you identify the radius around the well and you pull the panels out. If the applicant subsequently finds that they can put panels there, then I might be okay to do that at the issuance of the building permit. But we would have taken the more conservative approach in removing the panels and protecting the well. Pretty simple to me. So I'll yeah. just throw that out as an idea. Carolyn, mostly for you. Yeah. So, Mr. Dira, this is, this is, this is uh, Ralph Palumbo. That's logical. Um, it accomplished the same thing that I was trying to accomplish. So, I mean, that's just fine, okay? Very good, thank you. Okay. All right, so anything anything else with the well? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to tear the lid off of that one. I, this is Carol. Chairman Diorio. Yes. I, I, Chairman Diorio. I, go ahead, Ron, I'll shut up. I'll shut up. Thank you. Uh, there's one thing that's, that's not really clear on the plans that I'm looking at, and this is just an assumption on my part. I'm thinking that the well is where the pump house is. They've got a pump house to pump something. There's already panels that have been pulled back from that area. Is Ron, that the area we're talking about? Yeah, Ron, can you give me a sheet number so I can follow your thinking? It is sheet number eight. And I'm looking at something that's pretty much equidistance between Infiltration Basin Charlie and Infiltration Basin Delta. It's, it's where it curves around the, the wetland. I can answer. I can answer that, Chair, if you'd like, Dave Russo. The pump house that you're speaking of, Ron, is the the existing pump is currently connected to. Uh, there's a small building on the east side of the property, which is used as part of the golf uh, facility. Uh, there's a the well on the property uh, fed into that pump house, and, uh, which was attached to that building. And then that building fed the water back down to the restaurant. So part of the uh, process that we looked at was relocating that uh, pump facility uh, off that building and off that ridge, uh, ridge line. Okay, that still doesn't answer the question of where the well is. Is it at the pump house? Oh, <clears throat> yes, it, it's in that uh, vicinity, yes. Okay, so, thank you. I'm sorry, Ron, very good question. And so that speaks directly to my one of my initial questions, which is 
what's the radius, where does it take place, and how much area is impacted? It, it would, uh, Dave Russo again, it would be where that, where we're proposing the pump house is where the existing well is. So it would be 200 feet located off of uh, that area where the well is. And the well is right next to the pump house. You can see it, um, you can see the sheet that, um, sheet eight, you can see the pump house, uh, it's labeled the wells did just east of that, just next to it. So the 200 foot radius would be off of that. Okay, very good, thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, anything else having to do with general layout? Can we move on to landscaping? Planning board members. Agreed. Yeah, agreed. Okay, planning board members, concerns, questions, or comments about landscaping? I'm happy to Is leave. Is this the part where we talk about the berm? Uh, yes, you may. You may talk about the berm. Okay, I'd like some definition on, uh, I'd like the details of the berm, what they're proposing. This is John Carter. This is John Carter, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, yes, members of the board, uh, John Carter, I'm a registered landscape architect, 960 Boston Nick Road, Narragansett. Um, just a, a, I want to respect the chair's request to keep things Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm having, is he breaking up? I'm break, he's breaking up for me. Okay. I wasn't able to hear him. If he could just repeat, please. Yes, can you hear me like this? Speak louder. A little bit, it's, uh, um, the, uh, I, I, I want to keep my uh, remarks brief. I want to uh, answer your question regarding the berms, but I know uh, that there's been a little bit of discussion about uh, sort of how we got to this point, and I just want to briefly remind or, or, or review at the initial board meeting, we presented a landscaping plan where we were proposing to use a lot of the existing native vegetation that was on the site, which is primarily eight to 10 foot high red cedars and white pines. And we proposed to do uh, sort of an infill planting along the on-ramp and uh, to do that along the Maxon Hill Road side and a couple of other places. We were told, I left that meeting having been told uh, two things. One, we don't want to see this. Well, the chairman said, I don't want to see this, uh, which is a high barrier. Um, and in addition, we're designing to the best of our ability so we don't see it, but we're, uh, the standard we're meeting is a standard that's in the ordinance. And so I was also told, well, we don't want to wait for the plants to grow. So a vegetated buffer is not a, uh, a rigid um, barrier. It's a dynamic barrier and plants grow. They, uh, some grow faster than others. We deal with the, you know, mechanics of transplanting and survivability and water and storm damage, insects, pests, deer, and so forth. So it said, okay, well, what are we going to do in lieu of that? So in the ordinance, it allows a fence. A fence, uh, no less than six feet high. But a six foot fence is not going to be effective all around this site. And there's a variety of views, as you know, uh, onto this site. So we look at using uh, basically a combination of an earthen berm 
which would be material that would be the uh, left over from the grading on the site. So an earthen berm that would be vegetated with uh, uh, erosion control seed mix to hold it in place and to eventually cover it in vegetation. A fence, and then in some cases, additional planting down around the restaurant and so forth. We did that with the entrance on, on into the restaurant is. And the reason for that is that we were, able, we were able to control the height of it, the location of it, and we took some representational transects off level views from different spots around the sun and tried to develop a barrier that would be a physical and immediate uh, visual barrier onto the site. So it would be constructed of, of uh, earthen berm, a fence, and in some places, some additional uh, vegetation. That's how we got to where we got, and that is what we're proposing. And it does, uh, in my opinion, the best we can uh, meet the ordinances uh, guidelines that we provide a visual screen and minimize views and so forth. Carol, does that answer your question about the burn? No, no, I'm talking about the uh, berm that would be on the east side of the property. Okay. And, you know, oh, yeah. earlier oh. said that you're not going to, not leaving the vegetated buffer. So that, that's what I'm addressing. We already talked about the uh, uh, buffer on the uh, 95 side of the pod. So I, I'm looking for more insight as to how the east side of the property is going to be handled if you're not leaving the vegetated buffer and you're going to be in, putting in a berm. How high is that berm going to be? What's it going to look like? Is it going to okay. cover the height of the, the neighbors across the street over there? I understand. So we're talking about basically where the site abut abuts Maxton Hill Road. So as Dave Russo pointed out, the, the panels will be set back 100 feet from the property line. And there's an area on the landscape plan on sheet one of four, and there's a legend in the lower left corner that indicates the various proposed uses of of the landscape buffer. So that cross-hatched area indicates an area that the tall trees to cast shade onto the panels will be removed. All the existing vegetation there, all the understory vegetation there, which is actually the most effective for screening, uh, will remain in place. Then as you move inward towards the site, there's going to be an earthen berm, and it's indicated in yellow, with a fence on top of it. And so the intent there, screen, and I think it will be, in my opinion, uh, a very effective screen from Maxon Hill Road. Now, a couple of the neighbors uh, uh, are elevated quite a bit. Above the above the road, so it wouldn't be possible, in my opinion, to put an immediate screen there because it would be it would have to be uh, impractically tall, impractically tall, and there's a you know there's a necessity for uh, not putting shade onto the panel so that it won't work. So. The transects that we did, the six transects, were really representational of different points of view onto the site. And we did actually look, I believe, at the board's request uh, at one of the lots across the street, lot 52, um, is, which would be transect five, and then the transect four and transect three were from the road looking into the site. And so there'll be vegetation, there'll be an earthen berm that will be vegetated, and then on top of that will be a fence. On top of that, there will be what? A fence. 
Thank you. So what are you anticipating for the height of this earthen berm? Well, in that particular case where that uh, uh, transect is drawn, the transect number five, uh, we have uh, a berm height of about uh, probably five feet on one side, because the grade naturally goes up, the berm would be steeper down on the road side. The grade actually from Maxon Hill Road drops down slightly and then goes back up again. So it would be about five feet on the back side, on the in inland side, and maybe seven or eight feet tall on the road side. With a, berm with a fence on top of it, which would then accomplish uh, 11 feet or 12 or 14, depending on where it is. The, the berm is intended to be somewhat variable in height because the views onto the site are not fixed, they're dynamic, and they change as you move around. So it gives an opportunity to uh, adjust it to be effective in terms of blocking the view onto the site. John. Uh, any other thoughts or comments there? If not, I would like I would like to weigh in on the fence. So, John, I want to appreciate I want to express my appreciation for uh, identifying myself as the person who told you that I don't want to see this thing. Thank you very much. However, I was really hoping you would accomplish this by vegetation and not a stockade fence, which I am not in favor of. So I think you can still do this by vegetation. Uh, a stockade fence is completely out of character here. We have made an exception. I will certainly admit to that. But I think, the, I think there were some extenuating circumstances on that. And that has not been the kind of fencing that we have typically approved these projects. So, I want to go back to the actual verbiage of the ordinance uh, was butchered a little bit by Steve earlier. Uh, there's a requirement for a perimeter, I agree, of a style to be determined by the planning board. And I think that gives us a significant discretion as to whether there's sense and what type it is. So I, I just want to lay in with it. While I appreciate that you had to deep into your trick bag to accomplish the screening of this, I think we can do a little bit of my personal opinion. Other planning board members. Ron here. I would agree that a vegetative barrier would look, to my eye, much more appealing. Uh, however, I'll leave it up to the rest of the planning board and whoever else to decide exactly what they want to put there. Uh, this, this is Carolyn. I, I just want to comment on past experiences with fences and berms. Uh, they, they still are exposing the site dramatically and with the property owners so close to the project, I think it would, it, it's beneficial that we find a better way to handle that buffer zone. And I, I would like to have heard something like we're going to have a vegetated buffer that's going to be seven feet tall. Uh, with trees on top of it, and that's that's what I envision as an appropriate berm, kind of like what we see on the uh, north side of the property along 95. Attorney Karen Browning, on behalf of the applicant, 
So I think reference was made a few moments ago to the ordinance, and I want to make sure that we're all looking at the same language here. Um, my reading of the ordinance under subsection A, number three, states the ground level facility shall, shall be enclosed by a perimeter fence. And then further down in that paragraph, in addition to the fence, further obstructive view, the planning board may approve a vegetative buffer. I just want to be clear here that it's our understanding and this application was prepared to conform with this ordinance, which clearly requires a fence. Okay, so the fence issue is not being disputed. It's the type of fence. And to that extent, I think it's important to mention that as part of the application, we did need to consult with the town fire. And it's my understanding that the fire officials have been in contact with the planner to indicate that their final review uh, will take place after uh, the planning board's review and, and, and hopeful approval. Um, and I would respectfully put out there that I think that the fire department may have um, a, a, a life safety consideration on the fence consideration. I don't know, uh, Dave Russo, maybe he can talk a little bit about what um, fire has um, provided for feedback on the type of fence, uh, just so that we don't end up going back and forth. Uh, respectfully, we don't have to go any further than ordinance stating of a style to be determined by the planning board. Yes, except that if we do then submit this to the fire department, um, there may be a risk of having to go back and forth. And to the extent we can eliminate that, I think that, that should be on the record. In, ter in Dave Russo, Dupree Engineering, in terms of the, the fencing with the fire department, um, our experience with the Ashway Fire Department is they, they have approved uh, various types of fence, um, stockade, chain link, um, and the seven, seven foot height is what they uh, require um, as part of that. Jim, uh, Jim Lamp, please. Yes, yeah, so Jim Lamp, your town planner. I had a question for John Cotter. Um, in the northern um, most uh, solar array area there that I was talking about earlier, um, the landscape plan is a little unclear to me. It, it shows a berm. Top of that berm says a Don't see any kind of vegetation. Can you I'm sorry, I'm not. He's breaking up. He's breaking up. I couldn't hear him. Sorry, Mr. Okay. Measure. The, the, uh, right next west of Lafayette on the left land. The yellow area, which indicates the berm. And on top of the berm, there, there is a fence, but but it's the chain link fence on top of that berm. So I, I didn't see any vegetation associated with that berm. Can you tell me exactly what you have planned for that area, John? Yes, John Carter. Uh, I, the way you describe it is what's proposed. It's proposed to be the earthen berm. Uh, it's a considerable distance from the home there uh, through a lot of uh, a whole bunch of very thick trees. So, and, and the grade is such that um, it actually drops down from the residence. So uh, it's just a it's a berm with a perimeter fence on top of it. Okay, John, thank you. That's what I saw. Uh, just to add, Dave Russo, the pre engineer, just to add to that, the topography over there goes down towards the wetland in that area. The panels in that area sit between elevations 162 to 168. The top of that berm is at 184. On average, so the berm is much higher than those uh, that panel area. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other thoughts on landscape?
This is Emily. Um, I, I'm still a little bit stuck on the area of selective clearing on the east side, um, which is really close to the most residences on Maxon Hill. Um, I just, you know, the reason given for the selective clearing was to clear tall trees that might shade the panels. And I just cannot imagine how tall trees that far away from the panels to the east of the panels would cause any shade. So I think it's really, really critical that trees in that area stay um, in order to buffer the view and, you know, maintain some semblance of the existing condition for the residences that uh, immediately abut that part of the site. Thank you, Emily. I concur. I thought we had covered the ground that the 100 foot setback was going to be in a vegetated state. John, I'm looking at your plans right now and suddenly it doesn't look that way. So this could be uh, no problem. It's a condition of the, uh, of the approval should the board decide to move in that direction. But I'm under the impression that our discussions tonight is that 100 foot setback is a vegetated area. This is John Carter. Um, that's not uh, what's being represented here. Um, so I think that what, what Dave Russo described, what I described, uh, in some cases there's 100 feet of vegetation uh, along Frontier Road. Uh, rounding the corner to Maxon Hill Road, there's 100 feet. Uh, as we come up along Maxon Hill Road, there's not 100 feet, it's 100 feet to the panels. Um, and the same along uh, uh, the entrance ramp where it would be a 75 foot setback to the panel from the property line. Additionally, there is a grade change, a berm that I believe Fallon referred to, uh, that's on the state highway uh, that's heavily vegetated, it's off the property. Um, but there's not on those two areas, there's not a 100 foot vegetated buffer inside the property line. John, thank you for the clarification. I, th I think what I'm suggesting is that's what will happen in the next iteration. Well, it, under the ordinance, um, there's a maximum of 40%, meaning, I'm sorry, let me back up. You have in your ordinance a limit on clearing in instances where a parcel is rezoned from RFR 80. In those cases, the maximum amount that can be cleared is 40% of the total area of the parcel. Now, that's not the case here. We are not RFR 80. We are a manufacturing zone. And here, the area that we're proposing to clear is approximately nine acres, a little over nine acres. 14.1% of the, of the lot. So even by the strictest standard in your ordinance of 40% of clearing, we are still well below that. And, and that 40% again doesn't apply. So there is no requirement in the ordinance that would support a condition that we're talking about now. Uh, this is Carol, and I think we're all clear that we're not talking about uh, zone change. So it's not important to hear what happens if this was RFR 82 uh, commercial manufacturing. We're, well, we're I talking think specifically, specifically I to think, this project. And we can't I think compare. it's important to know that your ordinance and your town council set forth a requirement for RFR 80 parcels. There is no such requirement for a manufacturing parcel. And even if you assume that that requirement was meant to be the most conservative, we're still well below it. I hear your and comment. We I hear your comment. I'm suggesting it as a condition of approval. My personal recommendation. In, 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 our, in our opinion, that would not be in keeping with requirement under your ordinance or in this board's charge 
which is to evaluate a DPR application compared to the ordinance. And if it meets the ordinance, that that is the end of the charge. That that is that would justify an approval. I hear your comment. Uh, Jim Lamphia, Town Plan. I'd just like to read from that same paragraph. But the next sentence it says, "Clearing of any existing vegetation within the front, rear, and side yard setback areas is prohibited unless explicitly approved by the planning board." Unambiguous to me. Uh, I don't, we need, we don't need to debate this, obviously, applicant and at least myself have different opinions on this. Uh, I don't need to spend a lot more time on this. Uh, I'm ready to move on. This is Carolyn. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, there was some overlap. Okay. Was there a comment? Uh, yeah, Ron here. I, I just want to say that I agree with uh, Chairman DiOrio. We've covered this significantly, and I think it's plenty. Okay, very good. Thank you. So, listen, I'm ready to move well, on to the next topic if uh, plenty board members are in agreement. I'm ready. Next topic is decommissioning. I don't mind tearing the lid off of it. Here we go. So, uh, I'm familiar with what we're supposed to be doing here. And uh, Steve, I'm going to direct some of this at you, please. So, and, and I guess just let me be candid. And if I'm stepping out of line, please let me know. But so, you're operating as the town engineer. I'm putting that in quotes. So I don't necessarily view the town engineer as a person, of course. I recognize that I interpret the town engineer as an entity, a, a party, a firm, such as yours. Your firm is operating as the town engineer. So I'm fully aware that we're, we're looking for you to, uh, to verify the decommissioning values and we're obligated to go along with your representation. I'm perfectly okay with all of that. So what I had been hoping was going to transpire was that because decommissioning is, a, uh, you know, still in my, at least in my naive approach, a little bit of a, an unknown science, uh, I guess I was hoping that your firm would procure the services of, uh, uh, let, me, let me put the word expert in, quote, in quotes because we'll get around to that, to delve into decommissioning uh, as a task and, and give us a report accordingly. It would still be under the auspices of your firm, hence the town engineer. That's what I was hoping was going to transpire. I think I recollect accurately that that did in fact take place, but there were, well, let me call them complications as to why we didn't really get to that really? point. But what confuses me is why didn't we procure the services of another quote, expert firm in decommissioning? So can, can we get an answer to that question first? Steve, please. Steve, you can speak. Okay. Uh, hello, this is Steve uh, Cabal from Crossman. Uh, first, let me talk briefly about decommissioning. When it comes to estimating the cost, there are essentially three major components of decommissioning. One is just the manual labor of removing the racks. There's nothing special. It's strictly manual labor. The second item would be the earthwork associated with fixing areas that may have been eroded or that need landscaping or loaming and seeding. And the third one is the, the salvage value. And as an engineer that have been 
practicing for, um, I hate to say it, almost 40 years now. The first two components, the manual labor and the earthwork, are re relatively straightforward. The, the major concern that we have is the salvage value. And in all honesty, we don't believe, we have not found an expert who can certify with any accuracy what the salvage value of the equipment is going to be in 25 years. Now, now I say that based upon our discussions with companies that are involved in that field. And we did get some rough numbers, but we didn't use their salvage value numbers because we disagreed with them. And let, I'll explain further. When it comes to the salvage value, one unknown is going to be, can any of the panels or the racks be sold and reused, or do they all have to be uh, recycled or disposed? Now, we received information from one theoretical expert, and if the material could be reused at a lower capacity, they had estimated that the value could be up to $1.2 million, the salvage value. On the opposite end, they felt that if you broke down the amount of steel, aluminum, copper in the entire system, they felt that the minimum would be in the three to six hundred thousand dollar range for the, the salvage value. But as an engineer, I know that there is no one that can certify what the salvage value will be 25 years from now. Now, the, the natural thought would be use today's values and assume it's going to have a future growth or decrease in the same manner as the, the past. But that's not, that's not going to give anyone any sense of comfort because in the future there may be, you know, plastic or high density polyethylene type racking system. So there are so many unknowns when it comes to decommissioning. So in our numbers, we're confident in the, the manual labor aspect as well as the earthwork aspect. And for the salvage value, we used what we feel is a, a low number based upon talking to the theoretical experts if there is such a thing. And I, I don't say that in a joking manner, but that's my honest opinion that, that there is no expert that can certify salvage values 20 years from now. And the applicant probably feels the same way. It's, it's an estimate. Now, when I read the ordinance, the, the primary question that we had is the ordinance states that the course needs to be provided, but it's silent when it comes to a credit for salvage value. I, I understand. St Steve, thank you so much. So there are some things here that I was certainly not aware of. So first of all, your representation is that for the bulk of decommissioning in terms of estimating its cost, this is a largely uh, engineering number crunching task because exactly. it, sounds like, it sounds like these things not these specific things but things very closely related to them go on every day and in your experience you you have a firm grasp of what these costs would be sound reasonable yeah good it, Second, it is and and i and i say that because we we did research available data from other states so it's not as though we just estimated independently. We looked at, say, for example, New York has good guidelines for estimating decommissioning costs. And then we found other certified estimates. And there was a commonality when it comes to the labor costs. So yes, I agree with that. Okay, good. So, and then so the other thing that is not evident here, and perhaps I simply overlooked it in the 
wealth of information that I've been going through here, is that you did in fact reach out to others in the field to support some of your conclusions. Yes, and actually the input we received was giving a higher salvage value that we didn't feel we, we could defend. I understand. Okay, good. These are important points that I was not aware of. It makes me feel much more comfortable. Now let's drill down right to the salvage value. So my question to you is, given the uncertainty of what's going to transpire in 25 years, and I could, I could list a, a whole pile of concerns that I have about where we're going to be in 25 years with a bazillion panels suddenly reaching their anticipated lifespan, and the fact that the planning board's charge here in developing this, this estimate is to err on the side of protecting the town. I, I'm not interested in protecting the applicant here. The applicant's got to fend for himself. He's in the development business and that's what he does. My job is to ensure that the town doesn't take on undue risk. And of course, you're with me in that task as the town engineer. So my question to you is, why aren't we simply deleting salvage value from the equation? And here's my thought process. Listen, 25 years from now, if the applicant or whoever is going to be around managing this Fandango uh, procures $1.2 million, I, I'm thrilled for them. Good for them. If, on the other hand, 25 years from now, they get a dollar three eighty for everything out there. Uh, I'm thinking too bad. So why is the town taking a part in this projection of salvage value? Straighten me out, please. Well, in our estimate, we identify that as a separate line item so that that discussion could occur. And the reason we kept it as but the reason we kept it as a separate line item is in decommissioning estimates that we've seen, it's common to state the salvage value as a cost reduction. But as I said, the town ordinance is silent on whether or not that can be done. So therefore, we kept it as a separate line item so that you could bring that topic up. Oh, and one, one other note that I added on our estimate is that there's a segment of the site that's wooded that would be the northwest section and it wasn't clear to us whether or not the planning board would require that to be reforested so we made a footnote that our estimate does not include reforestation of that area okay very good steve i appreciate that so those are the comments that i had for Decommissioning. Planning board members, I'm delighted to hear other comments or thoughts. This is Carolyn. I'll go. This is a question for Steve Cabral regarding the labor involved in removing the panel. You said that it's a very straightforward process to remove the panels. In, in your R&D, what did you determine is the process of removing one panel? You just detach it and bring it oh, to its property? Yes. It, that's essentially it. Essentially, it's manual labor <laughs> unscrewing, and, unscrewing and detaching the individual panels. Uh, of course, you want to do it in a manner that you don't damage them. Hmm. But yes, and of course, there are wires throughout the, process, throughout the site that have to be pulled and stockpiled. Okay. okay. Um, and I'm, one, I'm one, good, one, one good source that we found was, as I mentioned earlier, was uh, New York, and even there's a Massachusetts re reference, that developed a unit cost for decommissioning of a typical two megawatt solar facility. And their research showed that the unit rate could be prorated for different sizes. 
So when I had used their values on a per megawatt basis, it was in line with estimates that we, in as well as uh, DePuit had for the the removal process. Okay, then my my next question would be: Did Crossman review this decommissioning? And I'm speaking specifically to the removal of the panels as the removal of electronic waste. As elect no, not as waste because that would all come into the net salvage value. Not so when we, we say the yeah. So just to clarify, when when I stated the labor, that's just physically the labor of doing the work, not not the um, disposal or recycling cost benefit. Okay. Um, you know, the EPA has regulations regarding disposal of electronic space. And solar panels at the commercial level are the elephant in the And Rhode Island is not prepared to accept electronic waste, even if it were two megawatt projects. Uh, what I, my research has showed me is that removal of the channels includes the following. Collection of the serial numbers from each panel, from each piece of equipment, the inverters, transformers. Identify how many modules laser equipment will be processed, how and where they will be packaged, shipped, stored. The total weight in pounds for the modules has to be taken into consideration. Is there third-party logistics required for the shipment? In this case, as of today, there ha would have to be a third party involved because we have no capacity in the state of Ireland to accommodate electronic waste in that capacity. And there's other so on. But it's not a matter taking the panel of crap and putting it on a pallet and then putting it on a truck. It's a lot more detailed. The labor is completely unestimated as far as I'm concerned because it wouldn't just be a waste disposal company that would come to clear the property. It would have to be a much more sophisticated process. So oh, it is. Just, if, if I may, just to give you a little background, uh, I'm, you know, in addition to being an engineer with Crossman, I'm I'm a commissioner of a municipal utility company that provides electric power uh, to a community with 28,000 people. And our, the size of our electric company, we our income is about 30 million dollars per year, and we're responsible for overseeing all of the finances. That includes the capital expenditures, the budgets, as well as the disposition of. Uh, waste products, and I, I know your comments were implying that everything is waste, but from a practical point of view, we tend to find ways to reuse material. For example, transformers. There's a perception that transformers are all hazardous waste. Well, we have an employee that actually refurbishes transformers, and we reuse them. So, so I don't believe we can say or assume that everything is going to be a waste product. And, you know, when it comes to the salvage, you know, we could give you the pounds of modules, the pounds of racking. We have a summary of, of all of that. But the point with the salvage value being unknown is that it's the net of disposal and recycling value. And I admit, as I responded to the chairman's question, that's a big unknown, is what that salvage will be. Now, I, I agree. The Steve, well. I, I agree with you. And um, I'm looking at this from a recycling perspective that includes repurposing equipment. That not all of the panels are going to be damaged. They can be repurposed 
somewhere else. And there's lots of opportunities out there. But what I am suggesting is that it's not merely the removal of a panel from a rash. It's a photograph, it's traceability. We have for, for if, if there are 10 panels that are damaged, it has its waste and there has to be a traceability feature included in the removal of the program. Um, and and I'm, I'm not gonna elaborate anymore, but th those are my comments. So uh, I, mean, I, I agree I, I with your comment on the salvage value as well. It's, very difficult to predict what the price of gold is going to be next year, let alone what it's doing now. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It, yeah. Oh, and one thing, I do agree with with you that our labor cost did not include the cost of repurposing. That was all factored into that net unknown that net salvage value. So I, I don't I don't want to cause any more confusion than I already have. So, Mr. Chairman, this is Ralph Colombo. I'd just like to add a few comments. So, solar panels are not e-waste, they're solid waste. I know firsthand because in the construction process, every job, we have panels that uh, when they ship, they get damaged, they get run over. Uh, JF and Argo Corporation is a solid waste and transportation facility. They've taken them uh, uh, with no issues and they do it all in a professional way. So, it is simple. They call up Canago, they come and they pick up job scrap from uh, from the job site, including wire and metal and panels, and they take it. Uh, so it is it is simple. You recycle it. We gave you a recycling uh, experts report, and uh, that is in the record. We also Canago's expert report quote is in the record. Um, as for salvage value, salvage value I, I can appreciate your point, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 25 years is very unpredictable. But you say the salvage value may not be there. Um, things, things progress. Okay? And just the process to remove panels today is rather manual. I would think in 25 years it will be very automated because the world will have buying of removal and it'll become very inexpensive, just like tree cutting years ago. We used sores to cut them down. Today we have monolithic machines that can come in and do it in a very efficient way. So the world progresses. Um, so I think it's really important to state that it's not e waste, it's solid waste, and it's accepted uh, right here in Rhode Island. Mr. Palumbo, with all due respect, why does the technical data sheet provided by the manufacturer of the Q-cell panel you're proposing to use classify them as electronic waste? Coming from the manufacturer's mouth and coming from all the research that I've done, it is electronic waste. A cell phone is electronic waste. A solar panel is electronic waste. And those are people that know better than me. But I'm reading the information that you provided to us in our packages. I will, I will, I will just beg to differ with you. Um, okay. Any other thoughts on decommissioning? I know Jim has something. Jim has. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think we might have an additional response from um, Sage on that issue of e-waste. Uh, I believe some additional. Information on this issue was provided by way of a memo. Um, I want to say in between the last meeting and this meeting, which has made its way, um, I expect, into the record, um, I'd ask that uh, Nicole Melanzi be allowed to speak to respond to that issue as well. Uh, okay, sure. Um, hi, this is Nicole Melanzi from Sage Environmental. So the term e-waste, electronic waste, comes from the environmental regulations. It's referred to as RECRA regulations, the 40 CFR section um, 273, which is where universal waste is defined. And so there's not a classification for solar panels in that regulation. So your statement about um, certain things as batteries being e-waste, lamps being e-waste, um, those are all true. but panels, solar panels are not part of that classification. They don't consider them electronic waste 
because they're actually generating the electricity. They're not using electricity. Um, and I'm not, I, I know that you had mentioned that there was a mention of it being e-waste in, in one of the data specification sheets, and I'm, I'm not sure which one you're referring to because I haven't seen where it's been stated for that. Um, the other aspect for, for this material is we worked with the manufacturer to obtain data on the toxicity of the panels because when you're classifying, when you go through 40 CFR 260, which is the RECRA regulation from EPA on defining first is the material a solid waste and then once you define it as a solid waste, is it a hazardous waste, you have to look at, a, they call it a T-clip where it's a certain analysis that they do where they, they take a sample of, of the material and it simulates what the material would see if it were to go into a landfill. And over time, would any of the to any toxic components leach out and create toxicity to that landfill? And so that was done for these solar panels where um, a, a sample of it was taken, it was ground up into very small pieces and then it was submitted for the T-clip analysis, and it came back showing that none of the toxicity thresholds for EPA as well as RIDEM were exceeded, which would mean it's not a hazardous waste. It would just be classified as a solid waste. And then further, so in the state of Rhode Island, there is an exemption for some electronic materials that cannot be disposed of in the landfill. And so those are specific to televisions, um, computers, which they include monitors, computer towers, laptops, and tablets, and then mercury-added products. But this is not a mercury-added product. So for the, from the standpoint, from a regulatory perspective and a client standpoint, the panels would be looked at as just solid waste. I, I appreciate that. Um, at the last meeting, it was noted by your team that the safety data sheet for these panels is not yet available. available. And I decided I was going to look at the safety data sheets that were available for the previous series of the same Q cell. And on those safety data sheets, on those technical data sheets, the manufacturer notes in fine print that they're e-waste. And I don't see Vinagro in the position without approval from the state of Rhode Island accepting a thousand solar panels um that's that's down the road I'm, I'm going to be candid with you i called the state of rhode island i said i'm a resident i have solar panels on my house i don't want them anymore i have four solar panels that i need to get rid of how do i do it and you know what they told me we can't answer that question so from a residential perspective, I was confused. From a commercial perspective, Rhode Island needs to do a lot of work to be able to support the continued development of solar projects throughout the state. I, I'm not picking on this project. Uh, Al mentioned earlier, our responsibilities are to the risk that the town of Hawkington could potentially incur 40 years down the road, 30 years down the road, when these projects have met their end of life. And I hope you can appreciate where that's coming from. Further, other research that I have done is in conjunction with what Crossman Engineering said, where the potential decommissioning cost could be extremely high. And I'm, my responsibility is limited to the community of Hopkinton. It's not to the financial viability of this project. It's to the long-term development of what we're trying to accomplish. And that in itself is not limited to a commercial program like solar or a restaurant or a house, all right? This is across the board. Our job is to make sure that these investments are going to protect the future of our community. And in my mind, if every solar project in in the town of Hopkinton were abandoned in 25 years, the town would go bankrupt. That's what we're responsible to look out for. And I don't see that our solicitor or our uh, town council president 
or that our financial manager would disagree that our responsibility is to make sure that we we have to take the right steps to ensure the future of this community and not turn it into a big solar wasteland. Okay, very good, thank you. I think Jim has something to add. Yeah, this is Jim Lamphere, the town planner. Um, we've heard a lot of various opinions tonight about decommissioning, but in, a, in an attempt to get us focused on probably where we need to go with this, I just wanna remind everyone that in terms of the ordinance, um, we've, we've followed it fairly well here. The, um, the applicant <clears throat> prepared a, a, an estimate, okay, from Dave Russo, a qualified engineer in the state of Rhode Island of $266,000 roughly. We had the town's engineer, who's also licensed to practice in the state of Rhode Island and a qualified expert to review this, he prepared his estimate and it came in at $278,000. Our solicitor had uh, considered both of these with respect to the ordinance and he has given us advice that we can increase that amount, if we're not comfortable with it, up to 125%. So let me, let's just go through Crossman's numbers for a second. They can, they can, down here with a cost of 434,000 and change to actually uh, dismantle this system. They built in a 10% contingency for unexpected uh, whatever, salvage uh, value uh, uh, you know, factor or whatever. And then that came up to 478,000. They subtracted a conservative $200,000 for salvage value and they came up with 278,064. Now, if you're not comfortable, the planning board with that number, and these are provided by expert witnesses. So that, just keep in mind that if you were to go to an, an appellate body on this, that's what you're gonna be, you're gonna have to refute that with another expert testimony, not just your opinion or your research. We need expert experts to provide testimony on this. Okay, we have two of them right now. And we also have our solicitors that say we can increase this by 125%. I did some calculations as to what the planning board might consider doing with this. Taking the base cost provided by Crossman of 434, 603 and 88 cents. If you take 25% of that, that's 108,650 and 97 cents. Add them together, you get 543,254.85. Subtracting the salvage value of $200,000, planning board, our solicitor says that the planning board could legally impose 343,254.85 cents. So that's, that's a, a, a premium over what Crossman has provided in his, in his uh, estimate. So I would ask the planning board to consider the advice rendered by our solicitor as to what we can legally do without any complications and make your decision based upon that. Okay. Okay. Next. So I'm sorry. Go ahead. We don't have, <laughs> I, I, I need to lean on the, we recycle solar estimate that said the salvage was a negative $77,000 in change. Uh, I, I have no other comments, and I'm I'm going. Bye. Okay, I'll, I'll throw in my two cents, uh, Jim. I see where you're coming from. I applaud your your uh, your thought process. Uh, I'm inclined to simply strike the estimated salvage value. I don't think I need to hear anything more than what Steve has already put on the record as an expert that this is the complete unknown. I certainly appreciate that he feels that he needs to put something in there, but I would just strike the 200 and go with the resultant value. My personal suggestion. Other planning board members on decommissioning. I agree about the resalvage. It would be a, a separate conversation altogether. It has nothing to do with decommissioning. It's, if, they, if they can 
establish a salvage value years from now that that just the cost at the time of decommissioning, not its value. This is Jim Lamphere again, town planner. I have a I have a thought to, to throw out there I, I came up with today. Um, uh, can I ask a question of the applicant? Who owns that parcel or those two parcels of land today? Uh, this, uh, Jim, this is Ralph Palumbo responding. It's uh, the individual is Joe Rando. It's, I believe the name of the entity is Hopkinton Investments, LLC. Okay, that, that's correct. Now, um, that, which leads me to a, a couple of other questions. There, there are two operation and maintenance plans associated with this submission. There is a stormwater operation and maintenance plan, and then there is an operation and maintenance plan. And if I can just read the stormwater operation and maintenance plan uh, for one second here. Um, the, the responsible, it says here that the um, responsible, uh, the property owner will also be the owner of the stormwater system. Upon completion of construction, the owner of the property, along with mailing and emergency contact information, must be added below. The, again, as you just stated, the owner of the, of the property, who is to own the stormwater system, that's related to your solar project is Hopkinton Investments LLC. Um, so I want to I, I want to ask you if this is correct. What I'm reading here is this, is this what you envision for the future, um, or not? Okay, uh, so with the free, can I just clarify that the DEM reviews those operation and maintenance manuals for stormwater. They require us to put a owner on there. So if, if we're working on a project and it's going through the DM process and the ownership may change at a later date, they require us to put the current owner on there. So that document will be a, uh, a document that'll get updated um, in the future prior to construction um, that we have to you know, ultimately complete prior to construction. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so to, just to round that into Roth, this is Ralph. We will purchase the property prior to the commencement of construction, and David will substitute Revity Energy in for um, our real estate entity, the Revity Real Estate, um, in for Hopkinton um, Investments. Okay. Now, a follow-up question to that: As far as the so. Yeah, uh, Jim, I'm having difficulty hearing you. So. Yeah, from Dave Russo's uh, panel of uh, June 6th, uh, number four, uh, concerning the operation and maintenance plan. Um, Dave claims that the operation and maintenance plan has been updated under section 2CXI, which is the wrong reference, uh, um, as requested to include owner, operator, and contact information, and a provision confirming that no module washing will be performed. I noticed that an addition was made that no module washing will be performed, but I did not see in the operation and maintenance plan any contact information whatsoever. And I, I look, I'm looking in the binder now, the, the, the latest, latest binder provided by Revity, where I didn't see any, any point of contact to, uh, if we had any issues down the line. Uh, Dave Russo with the pre Jim again that is a ongoing document that doesn't get finalized it, pri until prior to construction so all of that information very similar to the soil erosion control um, you know the contractor that's going to build the site um, you know we don't really finalize until they start the construction and that's all clear okay all right now that I've got those two housekeeping things out of the way uh, here's my thought for the day um, to make up an additional amount, amount that would uh, satisfy the planning board. Would, would the planning board consider an irrevocable letter of credit that attaches the, pro the parcel itself? So that would give you an additional land value there in addition to the cash escrow amount that would, that would uh, be, uh, hopefully be commensurate 
to, to give you enough assurance that we can decommission the thing. That's another, that's another way to get around this such that the town can have some assurance and the applicant, it's a little bit easier on them to, 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 to put, up, put up that money up front. So that's my thought. Jim, this is, this is Attorney Warren Browning. Just so we're clear, and I'm, I'm going to have to, you know, let the, my client respond to that. But just so we're clear, you're proposing a letter of credit in addition to, say, the escrow amount and the amount of, you what was the amount you stated before? 343,254. Is that what you're proposing? Oh, uh, that's what I suggested uh, because it doesn't because that amount that I come up with didn't seem to satisfy some uh, some of the planning board members. So they wanted to just uh, take away the two thousand two hundred thousand dollars salvage value. So again, I'm trying to I'm trying to make up this discrepancy between what we can do legally and what we might need to do to satisfy a planning board at little cost at little cost to the applicant. All you're doing is, is basically putting up the land. The land's not going anywhere and it's not gonna really be any cost to you. And yet it's something that the, that the town could go after if we had to, in addition to the cash escrow. I'm not, I'm not suggesting an either or scenario here. I'm suggesting a, a combination of cash escrow and to make up the difference, the land. Uh, so Jim, this is uh, Ralph Palumbo. I I appreciate it. I mean, I, that's a creative idea that we haven't uh, explored just yet. And uh, I would entertain it, but it would have to be subject to, uh, you know, I have capital partners and uh, we, we would put a mortgage uh, on the uh, property. And so as long as it was subject to that mortgage, that would be fine. But I'm not sure that would be acceptable to the town. You know, as for, you know, the global comment, I can appreciate Mr. Diorio's comment that he, his recommendation that he wants to exclude salvage value. Uh, however, I can just speak from experience uh, on 30 other projects and 30 other decommissioning uh, plans, including decommissioning plans in the very town of Hopkinton that allowed uh, the salvage value reduction for decommissioning, uh, and both for my project, but I know other projects in town and in state and out of state. Uh, it, it's very consistent and very widely accepted uh, to do it. And I think it's reasonable. Uh, the salvage value is based on commodity metals. Uh, so, you know, to, to, to take away that value um, is just not logical because it has true value today as we look at it and we'll have true value in the future. Okay, anything else on decommissioning? If I yeah, can weigh in a little bit out. I just oh. I think we have some overlap. Go ahead, Emily. Thanks, Ron. Just I'll be quick. I think we should strike the salvage value as well. Okay, my thoughts on this matter. The estimated salvage value that Crossman has put in here. First of all, I'd like to say we hire Crossman because we believe that they're capable of doing a job for us. If we didn't think that their estimates were accurate and we didn't have faith in them, we should get another company. That being said, they put in $200,000 for uh, salvage value, which the steel and stuff alone in 20 years, as the previous gentleman said, we don't know what it's going to be. I think it's, it's going to be a little bit low. Now, if we went with the 200,000 still in there, 278,064.26, in 20 years, according to this estimate that's in the binder that was supplied to us, that's $513,000 and a little bit. That comes up to a nice piece of change. In this estimate that they have, there's a few things on there that, in my mind, I would not agree with four inches of loam supplement, which is, what, $70,000? No, that's $40,000. The loam is already there. It's in this, uh, all of our guidelines and the solar ordinance that all soil has to stay there. There's already topsoil there that's going to be in use. So why do we have to bring in more? The next thing is trucking the recycle. If we take away the salvage value, we don't have to truck at the recycle because it's not going anywhere. That's a whole different op operation. 
as built survey, that's questionable. Inspections, we got a $10,000 for as built survey and $11,400 for inspections. In my mind, they overlap. So one of those needs to go away. The final report, okay, that's something that needs to be recorded. $3,040, it doesn't seem outrageous, but you know, and it's in there. So if we take all of those things into consideration, we're down to $384,000, $384, excuse me, $384,922 instead of the 478. Those are, those are my thoughts on the matter and thank you for your time. Mr. Chair, this is Attorney Browning. Um, I just want to make a comment, and, and I think it's important to note here, um, kind of in line with what the planner said earlier, um, your ordinance is very clear. Uh, this amount is to be determined by the town engineering consultant, and I think the purpose for putting that language in there um, is for this reason, that it is not um, to get into this sort of um, discussion on, on numbers and what comes in and what comes out by the planning board. Um, you have hired um, a, 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 an engineer, uh, Crossman. Uh, they have done an extremely thorough job on all fronts, um, and they have submitted the required decommissioning estimate. And that estimate includes a salvage value, and it includes a host of other items. That is the estimate that the, the, the final amount calculated shall be based on in accordance with your ordinance. I think it's important um, that if there are questions for Crossman uh, or certainly for, um, the, for Dupree um, on their decommissioning uh, information or on the We Recycle Solar report, uh, those are all, um, you know, opportunities to learn more about decommissioning. But when it comes to actually setting the value, that value is set by your engineering consultant through this estimate that has been submitted to the board. Thank you. I hear your comment. However, I also, our, I uh, however, our, however, our expert has already opine that the salvage value is a wild card. That opens up the door for the planning board to question that value. I'm not inclined well, I, to go digging around the rest of the estimate because I, I take uh, Stephen's word for it. If this, these are the numbers he wants to assign to it, that's great. But when we get an open admission, and this is not a criticism, by the way, Steve, that the salvage value is a, an unknown quantity, then I think the planning board has some latitude here. So it is not simply the estimate as determined by the town engineer. My, my personal. Well, and and I, I hear what you're saying. However, the estimate that was submitted for purposes of this hearing, for purposes of this application in accordance with your ordinance, includes the 200,000 estimated salvage value. That is the estimate that was put forth by your expert. Now, I will also just state for the record that the, there is a mechanism in your ordinance that should the town, in the unlikely event that they have to go in and decommission the project or the property, um, there is an additional provision in your ordinance that covers you uh, in terms of saying if there's additional money that's expended by the town to do that, the town has a right to then um, seek uh, those monies um, and, and collect those monies. I believe it also, I believe it also says also um, attorney fees. Um, so I, I get the town's concern, I get the planning board's concern, but again, the ordinance is very, very clear. Um, this is the estimate that was submitted by your engineer. We looked at it, we had conversations about it, um, and I think that this is the estimate that needs to be relied on. Hey, I hear your comment. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, may I um, chime in here? Sure, Sean. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Sean Clough, uh, acting uh, town solicitor on behalf of Kevin McAllister. In terms of the Crossman engineer and the, uh, the value provided and as the ordinance reads, the value that has been submitted is $278,064 and change, as you all, as you all see. Uh, 
uh, there are certainly questions regarding the estimated salvage value, as has been put on the record by the experts. So uh, the planning board is well within its rights to, to question that value. However, the, the lining or zeroing out of that line item itself may be um, beyond the scope of the planning board's uh, authority under the ordinance. However, you would certainly be within your right when considering the 125% increase cap to take into consideration the um, lack of uh, the accuracy or precision, if you will, uh, with the of the estimated salvage value when coming to a number above and beyond the 278,000. Okay. Sean, just so I could clarify on that, um, the 125% is, is, is it would be an additional, it would be an additional 25% on top of the bottom line number. Is that, that's your understanding? It's not a hundred, you know, double it. It's not 125%. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> and then, and then just to be clear as well, the estimate that was submitted by Crossman includes a 10% contingency already. So, and I think Mr. Lampier alluded to this earlier, to the extent that the planning board wanted to increase that 10% up to a total of 25%, um, you know, that's something to be discussed. But this engineering estimate already includes a contingency of 10%. So you would not get the benefit of both. That is, this is Jim Lamp here, Tom. That is correct. Uh, it would be 25% of the base cost. So we would we would just subtract that 10% right off the get-go, and then do do a fresh calculation based upon that. Works Thank you. Uh, yes, Aaron. Aaron, that that is correct. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Have we concluded our discussion on decommissioning? No, sir. Um. This is Carolyn. Earlier, the applicant admitted uh, when Emily questioned that the grading is still to be to be determined. Um, so, on that note, we have a line item there of trimming and pine grading disturbed areas. On June 10th, Crossman suggested that that amount should be $125,500. And it was ultimately reduced to $78,437. Um, I think it's an open item and we can't put a fixed number on that because the applicant admitted that it's unknown. Um, the other question I have is why was the R&D for the access road removed? It was only $5,615, but on June 10th, uh, that was there. And on June 12th, it disappeared. And I would like to highlight the other comment that Steve Cabral made. Um, forestation of some of the land is not included in this. So I don't think that this is a number we can rely on because admittedly by the applicant and Crossman Engineering, there is some holes in this. This is Jim Lamphia, Tom Plan. I just want to interject if I can for one second here. It's getting very, very close to 10 p.m. and we set the ground rules at the, at the start of the night there that we would end at 10. Um, so <clears throat> I'd also like to mention that we needed another extension from the applicant. I believe if I remember correctly, uh, we were granted a 30-day extension and that was on July 1st. So that just, that just takes us to the end of July. Um, we need to go at least until August 5th, which is the next regular meeting of the planning board. So I, I would like to uh, ask uh, the applicant for probably another, at least another 30 days. So. Uh, Jim, uh, Attorney Browning, um, it was our understanding that at the last meeting we extended a total of 30 days, which would bring us to your next meeting date um, of August, I, I forget the date, the 5th, I believe it's the 5th. So we are clear through the next meeting date? Well, 30 days, there's 31 days in July and August 5th is our next meeting. So that, that's more than 30 days. So I don't want to get caught on a technicality here. 
Yeah. Under yeah. For the record, we, we, we extend through the next meeting date of August 7th. Okay, I just want to mention one other thing too. Um, we did, I think we did a lot of work here tonight. I, I think there's probably some items still open for discussion, but um, uh, right now I got six items on the August 5th agenda. And this is one that I have penciled in because I figured we'd carry it over. But you can see, you can see how long it takes to go through all the details on these things as we did tonight. So you're going to be, you're going to have the company of five other things on August 5th. Um, you know, so be prepared. Does it, does it make sense to extend this meeting a little bit longer to 1030 perhaps? Plenty board members, how do you feel about that? I disagree. 10 o'clock is what we had originally agreed on. Same here, I agree, 10 o'clock. Yeah, uh, Carolyn, I agree. We've already extended three hours longer than we, than we really wanted to. <laughs> Sounds like a consensus to me. As much as I would like to bring this to resolution, I'm afraid that's not going to happen this evening. Although I will applaud everyone's effort. I think we made some tremendous progress here. It's come much further than I was uh, anticipating, and I'm very pleased about that. Chairman DiOrio. Okay. Yes, sir. Chairman, I have a suggestion. Go right ahead, please. What would the possibility, or this may be to, the, to our town planner, what would the possibility be of having an additional meeting like this in mid-August so as not to muddy the waters of the August 5th, or to leave that as a, a, a potential? for August 5th. Because as Jim said, you know, we, we get into a lot of discussion on this. It's all good discussion. Everything is great. I'm not trying to demean that. But if we do this again, August 5th, what of those projects are going to get kicked back? You know what I mean? I'm just trying to offer a, a possibility to get through this. Well, that's, uh, this is Jim Lanfrey. I'll, I'll try to answer that, Ron. That's why, if you recall, back on July 1st and probably for the last several meetings, I, I'm, I speak to the planning board because I anticipate what's coming down the pike. And that's why I tried to, you know, uh, I tried to get an appropriate discussion going even on the reforestation bond for another project, okay? That's another thing that's going to come back. So, um, you know, I appreciate the discussion too. These are these are difficult, difficult things that we're going through right now. But at some point, we have to stop work, working in a circular motion here and and focus in on and hone in on a decision. Um, otherwise, there's going to be no end to this thing, and the and the queue is going to get longer and longer. There are. I just want to say one thing that I I know there's probably several of you people that. We're interested in becoming planning board members because of the solar issue. I can tell you this, if that's, if that's what you're interested in, your thirst for those types of projects are going to be satisfied to no end because <laughs> the stuff we're going through tonight and we've been going through, we're actually prepping ourselves for the projects that are going to be coming forth. We're going to have a lot of solar over the next two years, so get ready for it. And that's why I'd like to see us really, I know this is difficult stuff. I wouldn't want to be in your position, uh, but it's, I think it's really important that we, that we see the light, if you will, okay, and, and we see where we are from a legal perspective, recognize early what it is we can do without undue uh, legal, uh, legal morass and get to it and just get it done. Get it done, we'll be better off for getting it done down the line. So that's my little thing for tonight. Thank you very much, Jim. Okay, so this would uh, be my recommendation. I'm sorry. Is there something else in there? The Mr. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, it's just Ralph Plum. Yeah. I didn't want to leave without uh, thanking uh, your board and Jim Lampere and all the team members of the town of Hopkinton for granting this special meeting and this robust debate. Um, we're appreciative of it. Thank you. Well, thank you. Appreciate the, uh, the thought. So here is my recommendation. I'd, I'd like to suggest that this be continued to the next meeting. However, I would very much like planning board members to begin to think about what they would like to see in a motion. 
because I don't think this is the kind of action, I'm presuming an approval here, but that may be speculative on my part. I don't think this is the kind of motion that's going to come out of thin air, that we've covered a lot of ground today. There are a lot of things that still need to be sorted out. Planning board members need to give those things some thought and come in with some cogent language such that it could be incorporated into a motion. This could trim off some of the time that we normally spend bantering back and forth trying to finesse our thoughts into language. So that's my recommendation. This is Carolyn. Before we make the motion, can I just bring up something that's been bugging me all night? <laughs> the, the applicant has um, been presenting a 9.25 megawatt project to us, and our agenda is consistently pointing to a 15.125 megawatt project. So I'd like to see that corrected to some capacity. Which one is it? Yeah, Carol, this is Ralph Palumbo. The 925 is the AC measure and the 10, uh, 125 is the DC measure. It's just too much measurements for solar. Uh, but we'll we'll uh, clean up anything we need to clean up with it, okay? Oh, no, I think it's on us. No worries. Okay, thank you. Hey, planning board members, what's your, uh, what's your thought? I'd like to make a motion that we close the meeting. Second. I have a motion. I have a second. Any further discussion? Uh, are we going? Are we going to move to continue this matter as well, Mr. Chair? Yes, we are making a motion. I'm sorry that got a little confusing. Motion to continue to the next. Ron, I would be looking for you to perhaps amend your motion. A motion to continue to a date certain that is going to be August 5th. August 5th. If you would be so kind. Okay, understood. I'd like to make a motion that we continue this until our next planned meeting of August 5th, and that we adjourn the meeting of January of July 15th. Very good. I have a motion. Can I have a re-second on that? I think that was key. Re-second. I have a motion. I have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Diorio, aye. Pearl was aye. Light on. <laughs> Emily, yes. Very good. I want to thank you all. I want to thank all the folks in the audience. We, it's unfortunate we did not get an opportunity to take public comment. I urge you to call back in at the uh, August 5th meeting. I'll be happy to entertain uh, any questions or comments that you might have. Uh, we'll, we'll just continue from there. Very good. Thank you all and have a good evening. Thank you very much. Mm.